Good evening. I'm calling to order the meeting of the Arlington Select Board for Wednesday, June 9th, 2021. As a preliminary matter, this is Select Board Chair Steve DeCourcy. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Diane Mahan. Let me go back. I think there may be an issue there. Uh, John Hurd. Yes. Len Diggins. Yes. Eric Helmuth. Yes. Diane Mahan. Okay, we'll go, we'll go back to her. Staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Adam Chapdelaine. Yes. Doug Heim. Yes. And Lauren Costa from the Select Board Office is participating remotely. Tonight's meeting of the Arlington Select Board is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020, which encourages and allows open meetings of state agencies and local governments to be conducted remotely in order to mitigate transmission of COVID-19 virus. The governor's order, which you can find posted with agenda materials on the town's website for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Before we begin, permit me to offer a few notes. First, this meeting is being conducted via Zoom, is being recorded, and is also being simultaneously broadcast on ACMI. Persons wishing to join the meeting by Zoom may find information on how to do so on the town's website. Persons participating by Zoom are reminded that they may be visible to others and that if you wish to participate, you are asked to provide your full name in the interest of developing a record of the meeting. All participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment and those persons are not required to identify themselves. Both Zoom participants and persons watching on ACMI can follow the posted agenda materials also found on the town's website using the Novus agenda platform. And finally, each vote will be taken by roll call. Um, before we continue to the agenda, I just want to make sure Mrs. Mahan, can you hear us? Um, yes, Mr. Chair, I'm sorry. Um, okay. John didn't get home in time, so I'm using my crappy laptop and phone. So uh, I'll do my best to stay in the meeting. If I don't, I'll text you. Actually, okay. I won't text you because we can't text during meetings. So thank you. Okay, or just signal me. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Okay, so we'll now continue to the next item on the agenda, which is item two, letter of appreciation for Howard Muse, chair of the Transportation Advisory Committee, uh, Mr. Diggins. Uh, Mr. Chair, and I'd like to, um, I make a motion that we postpone the meeting, the, the letter of appreciation with um, Mr. Muse because he is um, attending um, his last TAC meeting today. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Do we have a second? Okay, thank you, Mr. Hurd. So we have a motion to postpone. Um, unfortunately, with the meeting being canceled the other night, we ran up against a conflict. So we will attempt, we will schedule uh, Mr. Muse for a future select board meeting. We have a motion from Mr. Diggins. Second from Mr. Deherd. Mr. Helmuth, any questions or comments? Um, thank you. Mrs. Mahan, any questions or comments? No, thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Uh, okay, Attorney Heim, we have a motion and a second to postpone. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourse. Yes. It's an unanimous vote. Thank you. Item three, a request for a pride event at Uncle Sam Plaza on June 13th, 2021 from the LGBTQIA plus uh, in Rainbow Commission. Uh, I am gonna go to Mr. Diggins again on, on this one. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, as the liaison to the Rainbow Coalition, uh, and because I mean, they are out kind of painting the town or at least trying to, you know, I am here to, on their behalf to request that uh, we uh, give access to uh, sort of Stamp, Uncle Sam Park uh, at Mass Ave and Mystic Street in Arlington Center uh, on June 13th from 1230 p.m. For, till 430 p.m. for an event that will take place 
from 1 30 to 3 30 p.m essentially it's a meet and greet me they're expecting a, a small scale just to let people know that you know we're out and about trying to have fun in June, our usual uh, month for fun. Uh, we can't do anything large scale because we weren't able to plan anything for in advance because January, we didn't know what was gonna happen about now. So that's the request. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Uh, Mr. Helmuth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, no comments, questions, thank you. And, uh, um, oh, you were second for that, right? Thank you very much. Yes, I second okay. that, thank you very much. Sure. Still learning the ropes. No, no problem. Uh, Mrs. Mahan. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, I look forward to all the events that take place during Pride Month. And um, I just want to say real quick, because I have the form of the opportunity, um, especially around transgender gender, um, with some of my former cheerleaders. Um, one of them posted a very, I think, revealing, poignant, um, Facebook posting regarding transgender and people who have questions about it. And they really equated it to that, you know, when you're born and you, you start to write, you automatically know if you're a lefty or a righty. Um, and that's similar to transgender youth. Um, it's not what you're born with. It's what you know is you're a lefty or a righty. Um, and, and I thought that was a really good explanation of um, and I've used it a lot um, since five years ago that, that I heard about that because I know um, information is power and knowledge as well as I know, especially around LGBTQ, TIA, Rainbow Plus, um, especially around transgender youth. Um, and I have had a couple of cheerleaders uh, and their families and their friends that have been dealing with that. So I just kind of wanted to get that out. If you kind of equate it to you were born as a male or female, but your innate instinct determined if you were a lefty or righty in writing, not to equate that with, uh, but it's the same thing. What you know and your body is telling you uh, is the way to go. So thank you, Mr. Chair. I just kind of wanted to use the opportunity to relay that story that really helped me a lot. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Uh, Mr. Hurd. Happy to support it. Look forward to it. No more comments. Thank, thank you very much. And, and I, I support it as well. And also do want to add that the Pride Month banners will be going up along Mass Ave tomorrow morning. Um, and, and we thank the Rainbow Commission for working with us, uh, with, with the high school graduates as well. So on a motion by Mr. Diggins, seconded by Mr. Helmuth. Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. Dickorsi. Yes. It's an unanimous vote. Thank you. Okay, items four and five are within the consent agenda. Item four is a acceptance of donations, gifts, and grants. Uh, HHS COVID testing since Memorial Fund, community resiliency grant from the National League of Cities, election grant from the Grant Center for Tech and Civil Life, Item five is a request for a contractor drain layer license, Jim DeMauro, Daneller Line Service in Plymouth Meeting, Pennsylvania. Um, I am on item four, gonna turn it over to Attorney Heim for a brief uh, explanation and description. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as the board may recall from a relatively recent meeting where we accepted a donation of similar nature, these donations are actually uh, funds that were given to the town some time ago. Uh, the comptroller has been sort of tightening up practice with respect to how we process grants and donations. And so my sort of recommend my recommendation, given the fact that I think you'll actually be seeing a lot more of these on your agenda, is to have a straightforward vote to accept uh, all these monies, uh, even if it's not strictly necessary in every case, just to sort of dot I's and cross T's. Um, and then if we want to invite folks back to speak a little bit more substantively on the donations, these are really, uh, th this process of accepting them is really here to try to make sure that we can engage in proper accounting and expenditure of funds uh, quickly. So th these particular donations have already been received. 
in some cases, the funds have already been uh, expended, but um, technically speaking, they should have been accepted by the select board. And that's why they're sort of put on your agenda in a, in a group. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Hine. Uh, turning to the board, Mr. Helmuth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, move approval. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Mrs. Mahan. Um, I'll, I'll second that and um, I have a question that does not need to be answered tonight. Um, I noticed under the contractor drain layer license, um, it says a Massachusetts uh, name in the corporation, but it's out of Pennsylvania. So I was wondering if I could ask Attorney Helm, Attorney Hine, Attorney Helm, oh my gosh, sorry, Attorney Hine, um, not that I would expect him to know, and it's only because I recently was on a case regarding Crico and, and uh, medical malpractice insurance companies that um, they're kind of getting down to. Uh, when I see a Pennsylvania address, can we verify that that's like legit? Um, and, and the reason I say that is uh, one of the cases I've been a court reporter on that we're in the midst of is uh, Crico is trying to transfer responsibility to a different healthcare organization in Chicago, Illinois. And when you research that address, there's about 50 businesses that have the same address and none of them exist there. I'm just concerned about the Pennsylvania address. If, um, if you know already, which I don't expect you to, Attorney Heim or the town manager, um, that that's legit, but this is the first contractor license I've seen that has a Pennsylvania address. And I just want to make sure it's a legitimate corporation um, operating under the articles of incorporation in Massachusetts, even though they're based in Pennsylvania. So um, not to make extra work, but that kind of gives me pause. I'm willing to vote for it tonight, but I, I definitely have questions on that. And I don't know if uh, the town manager or town council through the chair could either comment on that or say, yeah, I'll look into it. Uh, Attorney Heim, did uh, I can comment on it. I will also look into it. I think it's a very good question uh, and a valid concern. My understanding is that with respect to a lot of these specific types of um, contractor dream air licenses, uh, a lot of folks are being brought in from out of state to help meet the demand for certain types of work and services. And as long as they're uh, qualified to do the work and um, uh, provide, you know, basically the right certificates, uh, business certificates, uh, and organization, uh, we can uh, grant them licenses, but I would be happy to follow through on it and make sure that we're not missing anything and that there's, uh, that, that everything is appropriate for an out-of-state contractor to perform work in Massachusetts. I think it's a valid thing for us to uh, just make sure that we're not missing anything. Absolutely. Okay. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I would just say too, my colleagues and attorney Hines, this is with the exception of going by my memory, um, some New Hampshire and Rhode Island. Uh, this is the first Pennsylvania contractor drains license I've seen. So I just want to make sure. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. But th thank you, Mrs. Mahan. And, and I think we can also follow up after the meeting later this week with the um, Mr. Copperthorne because he did um, send us a memo and I think he did check references. So we, between Attorney Heim and uh, Mr. Copperthorne, I think we can follow up on that. Um, okay, uh, Mr. Hurd. I could say with my speed and quickness of the Secretary of State's website, I just checked it. They're registered, they're validly registered as a foreign corporation in Massachusetts. So it's a Pennsylvania corporation that then gets registered in Massachusetts. So it is a valid Massachusetts for registered foreign corporation. Anyways, other than that, no further comments. Thank, thank you, Mr. Hurd. Mr. Diggins. My goodness, the things Mr. Hurd can do when he's not chair, I'm impressed. Yeah, no, no comments for me. Okay, and I have no comments, uh, thank you. Um, so on a motion by Mr. Helmuth, a second by Mrs. Mahan, Attorney Hine. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helm. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. I will say yes and, and reiterate my request that <clears throat> Attorney Heim and or the chair look into the address that's given in Pennsylvania for uh, Massachusetts 
um, business that that actually exists and it's not a they're using the address and nobody's there. Thank you. Julie noted. Mr. Nicorsi. Yes. Thank you. It's unanimous vote. Thank you. Uh, next item, item six, appointments to Disability Commission, Grace C Carpenter for a term to expire 131-2024. Uh, is Ms. Carpenter with us this evening? Yes, I see that she is. Good evening, Ms. Carpenter. Oh. Hi, everyone. Hi. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Th th thank you very much for joining us tonight. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, why you're interested in joining the Disability Commission? Yeah, um, so I'm Grace Carpenter. I live at uh, 14 Coolidge Road. Um, I started attending uh, meetings at the Disability Commission about three years ago, um, partly to know to get to know other people with disabilities. Um, I had I um, I used to work as a programmer, and I also uh, did some freelance writing. Um, but about eleven years ago, I had a severe stroke and became disabled in many ways. Um, I've had some recovery. So um, now that I have a little more energy, I'm, uh, I'm eager to help out. Um, I also uh, started attending uh, meetings because I had a few uh, problems with accessibility and I, um, and I in Arlington, I was curious to, to learn if uh, the town had some plans to address some of the things that I had um, encountered. Um, I, I've been very pleased to see some of the, the uh, improvements, like um, the Broadway Plaza renovations and other other things. Um, but I know that there's there are a lot of a lot of things to do um, to expand access um, beyond just uh, ramps and sidewalks. Um, I've been following the discussions about um, remote participation even after when it's still when it's uh, uh, safe to meet in person. Um, um, I know that there are some tech technical issues to make it to result to be resolved, but um, I think it's very exciting to have this uh, uh, discussion about how to um, lower barriers for people to participate in civic life. Um, and I'm very interested in working on communications. Um, and making it easier for the public to know what kinds of services and and um, and and programs are available for, for people with disabilities. Um, I've been working on a resource list of um, of uh, um, a, a, a resource list that would make it easier for people to know what kinds of uh, services are available and um, hopefully that will be on the website, on the town website. Um, so that's it, I guess. Thank you very much. Um, I will turn it to the board uh, for questions or comments. Mrs. Mahan. Um, I would like to move approval um, and thank Ms. Carpenter um, for volunteering her time and basically we're getting her expertise for free. Uh, we probably couldn't afford you uh, if we hired you maybe we should um and i understand um your sort of expertise in the background of stroke and as well as your uh desire to get information out um one thing um i think the town does a very good job of is um getting information out to our senior housing uh facilities our senior center but for those with disabilities who live or rent in private homes, um, I think we can do a better job reaching them. Um, I don't know if it's uh, having more postings on the town disability website, if it's partnering, partnering with um, uh, primary care physicians that, that treat the majority like Leahy of, of Arlington residents with disabilities, if it's um, going through, I know in my family, the Lori Center, which is also in partnership with Spalding, and I know Ms. Carpenter um, has a relationship with them. The Lori Center is fantastic, uh, as well as I kind of have a nursing home here. <laughs> Two of my other relatives, Perkins School for the Blind. Uh, but I, I, the thing that I see 
in, in my family dynamic is if I wasn't a member of the select board, I wouldn't be aware of what services are available for the disabled. And like you said, it's not just ramps and um, MBTA buses that accommodate it, it's, it's services. Um, so whatever you can do to kind of get that word out um, that if, if, you know, your daughter or mother is not a member of the select board, um, you're probably, and, and you live or rent in Arlington, there's, I don't know where you go to get that information. So I'm taking advantage of the opportunity that we have Ms. Carpenter Grace here with us tonight. I know you already stated that's something you want to do. And I just want to, A, make a motion to approve you and B, second your motion to get some more information out. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Uh, Mr. Hurd. I'd like to second the motion and just thank you for your willingness to step up and serve. We have many, many, many committees in town and they're all important, but this one is really in particularly important for the to make sure that the town is doing what we can to make ourselves accessible for people with disabilities, both residents and people that come here to visit. So thank you for your willing to serve and spend your time doing this important work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hurt. Mr. Diggins. Yes, and of course, again, I am happy to have you and your evidence to me, you know, the fact that any of us can find ourselves you know, in a position where we are challenged physically in a blink of an eye. And, uh, and also the, the benefits that, uh, that we as society uh, create to help the people with um, mobility challenges and other challenges generally affects benefits all the rest of us, the curb cuts or an example. And, and so look, when it comes to access you know, of meetings, I mean, I'm there with you completely. And, and so uh, I, I'm gonna be pushing as hard as you are uh, for this, but if you want to push me more, feel free. And I won't object at all. So, so welcome aboard me. Your resume, uh, your CV uh, is, is impressive in its variety. Uh, so you're a, definitely a positive asset. So thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Mr. Helmut. Thank you. I'm, I'm so pleased to, uh, to support this. And, um, and I have the privilege of knowing Ms. Carpenter um, as a neighbor a couple streets ago, two streets away as a friend. And, um, you know, I, I, it's, it's always amazing to me that people want to donate their time to the town. But I think that your desire to, uh, to contribute and to, and to give back and to help us do better is really, really touching and admirable. So, so thank you for that. Um, and just reinforcing something that Mr. Diggins said about remote access. Um, I, I'm glad that you mentioned that. I think the, the select board particularly will, and, and all the town bodies that meet will, really need to rely on the Disability Commission, um, particularly to help us prioritize uh, and, and understand, make sure that we're getting this right, because we do have a commitment to, um, to doing better. You know, once the state no longer lets us um, meet entirely remotely, we still, I think there's a commitment in the town to, to continue uh, allowing remote participations for exactly that reason. So yeah, there's technology, there's staffing, maybe some budget, but um, I think I'll just take the opportunity to say that select board is working now and I'm working with Mr. DeCourcy and some town officials to, to try to pioneer this so that we, we hope to be the first body doing hybrid meetings this summer so that the rest of the town bodies can learn from that. So. Um, welcome your input at any time walk over to my house or see you out on the walk give me a call and um and uh, thank you once again thanks thank you mr helmet and i also want to echo the comments of of my colleagues thank thank you for your your volunteer service to the town to date between the audits and, and the um, historical society and your willingness to serve on the disability commission and, and as mr helmet said um, we we really would like to to um, hear input from you as we go through this process of getting back to the chamber, but working remotely. So th th thank you so much. Um, so on a motion by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Hurd, Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmut. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Um, yes, and I just wanna note, I had to step away for like four seconds I may have to do that two or three more times because my husband had to work late tonight and I'm juggling here. So I, I apologize. It's not that I'm not listening. 
I'll, I'm definitely listening and I'll be right back. It'll be like three, four seconds. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. DeCourse. Yes. To unanimous vote. Thank you, Ms. Carpenter. Thank you. Okay, next item is open forum. Except in unusual circumstances, any matter presented for consideration of the board shall neither be acted upon nor decision made the night of the presentation in accordance with the policy under which the open forum was established. <clears throat> Excuse me. It should be noted that there is a three minute time limit to present a concern or request. Um, so I'll ask Mr. Chapman Lee if there's anybody, who, excuse me, who's raised their hand. I believe that the gentleman from the, for the next agenda item has raised his hand. Uh, and someone who I believe is interested in agenda item number nine has raised their hand. Okay, so I, I should point out it, it's so on number number nine. Okay, so both seven and nine, we if, if that's the applicant on number seven, we will be hearing from him. And on number nine, um, we will take comments from the public on that. So if it's if it's anything in addition to those two, uh, we'll have open forum now. Otherwise, we'll move on. And it sounds like that's it. Is that it, Mr. Chuck? So the, yeah, they're 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 keeping their hands up. I know it's a little tough to navigate here. Um, all right, one of them has put their hands down. I it's up to you. I okay. Do we, we want to? Do we want to? We can directly tell the, the the residents raising their hand that they will be heard under number nine. Is that that's right? Okay. Yeah. And okay. Okay, they're, they're they're keeping their hand up. I think. To... Well, why don't we promote them and right. just clarify that that's what they want to talk about, and then if it's they, something else, we'll allow them to have the open forum. They just put their hands down. Okay, good. Okay, all right. So uh, no open forum tonight, or we had open forum, but no speakers. Uh, item seven under traffic rules and orders, other business. A request for on street overnight parking permit waiver, Mark Lepler, 7 Wachusett Ave. Good evening, Mr. Lepler. If, if you can hear me, um, let's see, right now you're muted. Okay, great. Um, I apologize. I'm very young to the Zoom. I see my name. I don't see my picture, so I apologize. Okay, no problem. If, if, if you want to start the video, I don't know if you... If oh, here you, it goes. Yeah. There you go. Okay. As you can see, my entire family has taken over my laptop, so I don't know how to work it anymore. <laughs> okay. um, no, thank you for joining us tonight. So if you could let us know about the, the application and, and the, the request for the... Uh, parking permit waiver? Sure. We live at 7 Wachusett Avenue, my wife and I. We have five boys, um, one car garage. We have. She has been here probably for 12, 14 years. I moved in and we got married about eight or nine years ago. Um, and we have been parking one car on the street because three of our boys have started driving. One of them just graduated college and has moved back home. So until I can figure out a way to get him on his own, we have more cars than we can fit in our driveway. For about 12 years easily since I've been here, we have been able to park one car on the street overnight and have not received any tickets. There was last month when we received two tickets over the weekend and I spoke with Lauren about how to handle that and she said that I should apply to the town, join one of the meetings and see if there was a possibility of getting a waiver so that we could have one car on the street. I had sent in a picture of our driveway full of cars. I don't know if you have it because I wouldn't know how to show it to you, but I sent it in with my application. Um, I can tell you that the side of the street that we park on is directly in front of our house. Our neighbor next to us does not have their front door, nor do they have their driveway there at all. So we are not, if you look to the right of the Jeep, there is a house there, but they are on actual Wollaston Avenue. 
for their driveway and their house. So we are not blocking anybody across the street. And all I'm trying to ask is until my son actually moves out of the house, if we're able to keep one of our cars on the street overnight, we just have nowhere to put it. And I would leave it and try to put it off site in another lot, but they work. They, my other son is at Arlington High and he plays football and he's a lifeguard. These guys are coming and going all the time. So that is my small request. Um, that's where we are. Okay, thank, thank you. I'm gonna turn it to the board for, for questions or comments. Uh, and I will start with Mr. Hurd. Thank you, Mr. Corsi. Um, well, I certainly sympathize. And we've tried, we get a lot of these requests and we've tried to really boil it down to a what we call a check the box system for an overnight parking request. And the first one is always, do you have parking? And we've denied many requests for houses that have just one spot. So based on that and that alone, you know, I, my motion on this would, we move no action on the request just because there's a four car garage as it is right now. I'm sorry, four car garage? Four car, there's a oh. four car driveway. Okay. Right now. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Uh, Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, I, I'm going to um, second that motion, and it's pretty much for the reasons that Mr. Hurd uh, said. But I, I do have a question um, to you, Mr. Chair, for the for Mr. Lepler. Uh, uh, so, uh, has there been a delay in your son's ability to find um, his next step in life? Being, due to the pandemic? He is working remotely for New York Life and will be moving to Long Island, which is where the offices are located. They haven't opened up the offices yet. Um, he was trying to get out by August of this year. Yeah, We're still in limbo. Yeah. Um, I, as a father, I'm not gonna tell him to leave, but his mother and I would love him to leave only because yeah. we don't have the room. But it's right. strictly until he just leaves and goes to New York. He's driving out there every week, probably one week a month, just to connect with everybody out there. But they have yet to open up their offices for him to be able to move there. Right, right. I understand. I mean, and and I mean, the position that we're in is that we, we have heard requests, as um, Mr. Hurd has indicated, you know, um, from um, from applicants that have very very difficult stories, I mean, for lack of a better word, I mean, and we go by what uh, APD uh, recommends. In this case, they recommended no action on this, but, but I'm a problem, at least I try to problem solve right. you know, sometimes to people's chagrin, yeah, but would it be possible maybe for a neighbor um, to um, maybe help? We, we have actually approached it. Um, yeah. We're very close, obviously, with all our neighbors. Yeah. We've approached the woman across the street um, unfortunately, her husband passed away and we've been helping her with snow and everything. And we did approach her and she just felt uncomfortable to have another car in the driveway, which we completely understand. Right. Um, yeah. You know, I, I and I understand that my hardship is unique and it's not really a hardship compared to the hardships you have. So there would be no hard feelings. Um, we could park a car on the side of our house, which is not really a driveway which I wouldn't mind doing, which we could do temporarily as long as we don't get other complaints from the neighbors. Because if you look at the picture on the left, we have two cars. We could have put a third all the way in front, but just so the, the board would know, it's not really a driveway, but hopefully nobody would complain about that. Again, I understand that my hardship is not unique and it's not really a hardship. It's more of a inconvenience for having that many children. Well, no, and, and look, yeah, yeah, that's a, uh, uh, a way of phrasing it, and I appreciate that, and I appreciate your uh, forthrightness, uh, forth straightforwardness, uh, right. and in and, and the request, we, uh, and and one of the things that made me ask about the, the pandemic is that the the tone from the report by APD just made me think that this was I me mean, something that was just a kind of normal course of action. It did seem to me as if the pandemic might have had something to do with it. So my suggestion would be, hmm, 
I'm, I'm pausing because I don't know if I should offer this kind of advice. So I'm going to stop. Often when I say, <laughs> I hear people say, I shouldn't say this. I wish that they wouldn't say it. So I'm not this time. But, Does that mean but, it um, wasn't good advice or it just meant that you're better off not saying it? Well, I just want to be cautious. It's just that, I mean, should I tell someone to do something that might, you, you, have, a, you have a course of action in mind. Right. And let me just say that it would probably be my course of action. And were yeah. I a neighbor uh, and you told me why, I'd be hard pressed to complain. You know, so that's it. Thank you very much. No, it's my pleasure. And again, I realize I'm reaching for an excuse that is not really a hardship. So at least for hearing me, I really appreciate that. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Uh, Mr. Helmuth. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, I, I also need to. I feel like I should support the the sense of the board and and, uh, and vote to decline this. Uh, but I but I just want to emphasize that I, what I'm not, and I don't think that my colleagues are making about a judgment on on the hardship. I think everyone's situation is is important, and and you know if it's hard, it's hard. And um, and these are uh, unusual times. Um, and you know, and I think even without a pandemic, with younger people out of college, those transitions are just tough. So yes. I get that. Uh, our problem is this is uh, we have to be consistent in the rules that we that we make for for exceptions and I think that the for me that the period of time um, that he's been back home um, completely understandable but so not a judgment on your situation uh, just just evaluating against what we've what the board has done in the past to say this is where we can, what our policy says we can make an exception I, I think that is too much of a stretch, uh, stretch for me. So regretfully, I would, I would also go the same way, but, uh, but wish you well in your creative problem solving. I thank you very much. I really do. And um, again, I, I appreciate just being heard and of course. You know, maybe I can get rid of him sooner. I don't know, maybe this <laughs> I'll start charging him parking and we'll see how quickly he moves out. Thank, thank but you. I understand the precedent setting so that I'm completely aware of that, God forbid, I should get an acceptance, then you could have the entire town using this as precedent. And before you know it, it gets out of control. So I do understand. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Mahan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I want to say to uh, Mr. Leffler, Mark, thank you for being so understanding. Um, I, I can't tell you how many times we've gotten requests from residents of the town that they now have a brand new driver um, and they don't have any possible area uh, to put that car in. Um, and we've consistently, because of uh, overnight parking ban has gone to town meeting, it's gone to the town twice and it's been resoundingly um, voted down that we need to be guided by that. Um, and I will say, um, just for people out there listening, there's a very small minority that are so focused on the police. Arlington police do not ticket overnight parking unless a neighbor complains or unless they see a flagrant violation. You're, you're parked in an emergency vehicle lane in front of a, a, a fire hydrant. So um, I just want to let you know that this was not the town or the police department uh, taking it upon themselves. Um, they were actually, no, actually they were they're talking. the ones that suggested I come to you because the first one was a complaint, which was throwing us off because we've been here for so long. And I know our neighbors have not complained in 12 years. And he did explain to me that it's possible there was a complaint at the other end of the street because Wachusett is long and they could have just gotten the complaint and swept by the house. Or we really do have a neighbor that just doesn't appreciate our five boys in the backyard and is afraid to tell us. So, you know, no, no I. I just wanted to get the point across. The police do not go look to give overnight right. parking tickets. I Somebody understand. on the street has made a complaint because um, people have been really hyper focused on the police um, for whatever reason. And I like to defend them where I can. I, I know I see that you have a garage there. I don't know if you can clean that out. I also see. Do you believe that our cars do not fit in the garage because the owners previous to us put a structural beam underneath the ceiling of the garage? So I cannot even walk from one end of my garage to the other without hitting my head. And that that's what I felt bad about is actually showing you a picture of a garage that there we can't fit any of the cars that you see in there. They're either too long or too high. It's just. It is what it okay. is, and you know. 
I'm, I'm, I'm just going to finish my remarks. Usually it's not a back and forth. Okay. Um, Sorry about that. And I would say if your son's going to be there long term or any other children, um, I have three myself, um, two that can drive. Uh, perhaps you want to um, make the garage so that, but I, looking at your driveway, I see where you can fit a third vehicle in there. But if you need to get a fourth or God forbid a fifth, and the garage is not a viable option because of the way uh, it's been constructed. You know, if you want to accommodate a fourth or fifth car, maybe look into that. Um, as well as um, if you can check with the office about uh, being able to park it down overnight. I think it's a dollar a day, and it's not that far away from your house. I'm I'm, ju I'm just trying to give options and things like that. So, but my thing is, like my colleagues have said, you know, if, if we granted this first we have a recommendation from the police department as well as you know we've had other people come in that have said you know my son daughter daughters are now going to drive um we'd probably get five to eight hundred and i'm not exaggerating other people saying well you gave that guy a place on the street for his uh child they're going to come in again so it's the pandora's box so thank you mr chair thank you mrs mahan and uh, Mr. Lepo, thank, thank you for your understanding of the, uh, the dilemma we find ourselves in. And, and I, I am gonna support Mr. Hurd's motion. I, I did see that you do have room next to the house there and hopefully on a temporary basis before your son is able to go back to New York, you, you're able to utilize that or maybe expand the search a little bit beyond what you said have at the top of Wallston or even West Street, if you know anybody there, but it's it's, it's an unfortunate situation, but given our precedent, um, I'm going to go along with that vote as well. But I thank you for coming before us and, and for your understanding, as I said. Um, so on, on a motion by uh, Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mr. Diggins, Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Yes. Mr. Helmet. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourse. Yes. Unanimous vote. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for your time. Have a good evening. Thank you. You, you as well. Uh, item number eight for approval, three designated ride share parking spots at 23 Broadway, Escar LLC, represented by attorney Mary Winstanley O'Connor. Uh, is I believe attorney O'Connor is with us this evening. Good evening, Attorney O'Connor. Good evening. Thank I was you. Just going to suggest that you move your camera, but I'm glad <laughs> uh, you you did that. So um, we have the reference request, but if you could give us a little background on this, because I think this is related to the approval through the uh, the redevelopment board um, for this request for the the rideshare spots. That is correct, Mr. Chairman. Um, there was a discussion about um, uh, parking and traffic, and at that end of Broadway. If any of you go by day or night, there's no cars parked on either side of Broadway at that end. And it was actually my client's suggestion that three spaces in front of that building, 2123 Broadway, be designated exclusively for rideshare services so that uh, it would encourage rideshare services. There are a number, I believe 17 parking spaces in the lot, but we wanted to encourage the use of rideshare, Ubers, Lyfts, uh, taxis and the like. Great, thank you. Um, I will start with on this one on Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I will be happy to uh, uh, make a motion to approve this request. And, and I, I want to say that I am delighted to uh, read that ARB was um, be behind um, this idea, or maybe you, maybe um, your 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 client was, and ARB supported it. But I think this is really a good way to handle parking. And I think there will there are going to be possibilities to apply this in other places where um, parking is limited. And so I'm 100% behind this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Mr. Helmuth. Thank you. No questions or comments. I'm happy to support it and to second the motion. Thank you very much. Mrs. Mahan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry, I have to keep unmuting my phone. Um, I, I definitely support this, but I just have one question that I'd like to ask um, to the chair, uh, to Attorney O'Connor. 
only because of where I live on Howard Street between Robbins and Quincy. When I come down Robbins Road, more times than not, there's a very large Greater Boston Motorsports sort of motorcycle carrier. And I have no vision on the left-hand side. It's always bothered me and I've never done anything on it because I don't want them to say because of my position. When I'm a private citizen in the future, I will. Um, but in um, the correspondence from the chief through Officer Rateau, it cites the uh, uh, town bylaw about vehicles not parking within 20 feet of an intersection. I'm not really tight on that, but I just want to know in terms of ride share, um, do you anticipate or can you state that it will be an average size automobile versus something larger than that? Or can your client commit to um, not being within 20 feet of an inter intersection? I actually went by there myself to look at the area. We, they can be 20 feet away from the intersection. That's a non-issue, regular sized automobiles. You can actually put more than three there. So the three spaces do not present a problem. Okay, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Thank you, Mrs. Mahaj. Thank you, thank you, Attorney O'Connor and Mr. Chair, Attorney DeCorsi. Thank, thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Mr. Hurd, Attorney Hurd. Not today. <laughs> um, no, I'm happy to support this, and I like to see us go in this direction. Um, my question is: Is how a do we have any specifically? designated ride share locations now and would it be enforced with like a 10 5 15 minute parking limit and we'd mentioned taxis are taxis also i guess considered wide ride chairs if i may mr chairman i think That's taxis true. are kind of a ride shares it's not someone coming with their own vehicle and parking it in the lot yeah. Um, I don't know that it could be 10 or 15 minutes because, you know, there is a check in process when you go to these places and then you have to stand in line. So there was not going to be any specific time period. Uh, we were just going to put up erect signs that designate them as ride share only spaces. Okay. When the business is in operation. Yeah. Okay. I can't imagine that. I just, I mean, guys, that, that I don't think that people are going to want the taxi meter to be running while they're dawdling in the. Sure, 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 sure. My, my only concern which I, I'm sure in practical reality might not happen is that we think of like a taxi stand where taxis are sit are on meet don't have anyone on the meter who are sitting there just kind of waiting. And I mean there's a million places that whether it's a taxi driver or Uber driver could sit. I don't know if there is just some sort of 30 minute designation or it, may, it might not be necessary and I'm Certainly open to the board's consideration. I just wanted to make sure that we are actually seeing turnover in these spots as it is intended, as opposed to a place where either a taxi, an Uber driver, or a Lyft driver kind of sits for an extended period of time and waits for a fare. We could put on the side ride share for Escar customers only, you know, yep. that type of thing. Sure. Any other questions, Mr. Hurd? Nope. Okay, and, and, and I think the experience, we'll, we'll learn by the experience once, once this takes place as to whether further uh, signage is, is needed. But to follow up on your question, Mr. Hurd, I just, for, for Mr. Chapdelaine, are you aware of any other ride sharing parking spots in town? You know, I, I can't say with 100% certainty, but I'm, I cannot recall the board approving any similar spots to date. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Diggins, I see your hand up. Yes, you know, and I'm glad Mr. Hurd asked what he did because you know, I I was making an assumption, you know, based on just my understanding of how I define ride share is that, you know, they would drop them off and there we go. Uh, so I was kind of tempted to ask me, do we really need three? But I was like, okay, well, hopefully those are such good business that, you know, you have like three cars show up, drop off people and then go and then come back when they requested uh, to come back. So I had no um, thoughts you know, that anyone would be like lingering there for any amount of time, which is why I then said, I think that this model has applicability in places where we may find that you know, parking just really 
uh, is not desirable for other reasons. So, so, um, so I'm not going to say no at this point. I'm just going to say that I was under the assumption that that uh, it would be just drop off and go. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Mr. Diggins. And uh, I don't have any further questions. So on a, a motion by Mr. Diggins, seconded by Mr. Helmuth, uh, Attorney Hein. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Attorney O'Connor. Thank you all very much. Okay. Uh, item nine for discussion and approval relocation of bus stops on Pleasant Street. Daniel Amstutz, Senior Transportation Planner. Uh, good evening, Mr. Amstutz. Good evening. Thank you for sending along the materials. And um, so if you could provide us with an overview of um, what is being proposed here and uh, the, the locations of the various stops and the, the steps that, 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 that you have taken since the MBTA notified the town back in December. Sure, thank you. Um, Again, my name is Daniel Amstutz. I'm the Senior Transportation Planner for the town with the Department of Planning and Community Development. Um, a couple of other people are here. Um, if you need to ask questions of them, we have, uh, I believe they are here, Natasha Vance from the MBTA and Sandra Clary from McMahon Associates, which is the MBTA's consultant. So um, they could also, if they're here, could answer other questions that may be more specific to the T or to the work that the consultant has done. But um, if you're able to bring up the presentation I sent around, that uh, would be helpful for guiding the discussion. I believe Mr. Chapterline is able to, to share that with us. Dan, is that under the document that's labeled as your memorandum? No, it was sent around um, before, I believe, the May, um, May 25th or May 26th select board meeting. Um, so I was hoping it would be available again for this meeting, uh, for the meeting that was um, where it was postponed. And, and, and this may be the materials that, that were attached to our agenda. I have a planning memo. It doesn't appear as though it is, but I think I found the PowerPoint in question. Oh, thank you. Is this the right one, Dan? Yes, thank you. All right, um, so I'll just jump in here. So the, um, yes, this is a proposal to, whoops, if we can go back one. Thank you. This is a proposal to relocate uh, three bus stops on Pleasant Street. This uh, proposed by the MBTA as part of their bus stop accessibility and safety improvement program. Um, these bus stops serve Route 67, which goes the only bus route that goes down Pleasant Street, uh, go Turkey Hill to ALI Station. And the three stops that are being proposed to for the relocation are to move the Pleasant Street at Oak Knoll stop to uh, Pleasant Street at Wellington, adjacent to 93 Pleasant Street, um, and a little bit adjacent to 87 Pleasant Street. Um, Pleasant Street at Addison Street, which would be also move up to Wellington, basically next to 94 Pleasant Street, and then Pleasant Street at Irving, Irving Street, excuse me, that would be relocated to the far side of that intersection at 145 Pleasant Street. Um, so on the next slide, there's a bit more information on helping to display where that would actually happen. So um, so this shows the first two that are proposed for relocation. Uh, the Oak Knoll stop would move about 350 feet north uh, or northeast to uh, Pleasant and Wellington. And then Addison Street would move uh, again, 225 feet approximately north to Wellington Street as well. And on the next slide, there is a, a zoom in of what this looks like approximately. Um, so as I said, the the one on 
the west side going out or inbound to Alewife uh, would approximately straddle 87 and 93 Pleasant Street there. Um, and then the outbound to Turkey Hill would be next to uh, 94 Pleasant Street at Wellington. An important feature here that is uh, missing from the current locations is that there's a crosswalk across Pleasant Street here um, that is signed and marked and has curb ramps. And so uh, very important for accessibility, uh, ease of uh, transit users to get from both, get to both stops. Uh, on the next slide shows Irving Street. This would move from its uh, current location about 141, 143 Pleasant Street just before the signalized intersection here and would move to the other side of the street at 145 Pleasant, um, so after the intersection. Uh, on the next slide, a little more information about this, uh, the purpose of this program and why there are, or what benefits are from moving these bus stops. So the purpose of the program is to remove a couple of purposes, to remove accessibility barriers to bus stops, which are prioritized based on major access barriers, ridership, proximity to adjacent stops, Title VI considerations, and proximity to facilities that serve vulner vulnerable users. Uh, the other piece of this, you know, I think accessibility drives this program, but the other piece of this is the T and their consultant have analyzed the bus stops to determine if the relocation can improve service and also safety. And the uh, First benefit I have here really goes to the Irving and Pleasant Street one, where when you place it after a signalized intersection, it um, eliminates, uh, I, think what, I think what is called a triple stop problem, where a bus may stop behind you know, a row of cars that are waiting for a light to uh, turn yellow or turn green, excuse me. And then it will need to stop. If there's somebody there waiting for the bus or somebody that needs to get off, it will stop at the bus stop. If the light turns red while they're sitting, you know, at the bus stop, uh, letting somebody off or somebody coming on, they will need to wait again. So they will basically stop for a third time before they can continue. So this will improve service by eliminating that issue. Um, better bus stop spacing. Um, I don't believe I provided in the memo, but the um, bus stops. Uh, I think the one at Oak Knoll and Irving are currently about 600 feet apart, and this would um, change the stop spacing to be about a thousand feet apart. So the bus stops that are at Oak Knoll and Addison would get closer to Arlington Center. Um, and this is uh, new guidelines that the T has for bus stop spacing so that it can serve a greater number of people by, uh, and, and also reduce the incidence of the bus having to stop, at, you know, it stops once and then 500 feet later, it stops again. Um, and so it, it, it gets it closer and, uh, getting it closer to Arlington Center also moves it closer to transit generating land uses, including the church, uh, the two churches actually, um, and, and also the uh, a couple of businesses there, I believe. Um, there's also high density housing, I believe, that's uh, not far from, um, from that location as well. So, uh, and also improving pedestrian safety, I think is a really critical one. Um, again, moving these closer to the ones on the Wellington Street specifically, move it closer to a marked crosswalk so that it's easier for transit users to cross um, and accessible and it was an accessible crosswalk as well uh, as I think it currently has curb ramps but the T would would upgrade those as part of this uh, program if needed uh, on the next slide we'll talk a little bit about the public outreach um, the MBTA will send direct notifications to direct butters of the proposed locations um, in discussions with them, uh, you know, myself and the planning department decided that it would be a good idea to uh, send out a wider list of notifications. And so we sent a little over 250 notification letters to nearby residents and properties. And we also had our economic development coordinator have direct communication with the adjacent businesses there and churches. And so got um, a comment back from there. We didn't actually hear uh, anything from the churches but we received five comments in total. And the, the general themes of those was concerns about the noise of the bus, uh, I guess dust coming from it stopping and if it would be stopping uh, frequently for uh, dropping off or picking up passengers, issues of snow clearance, uh, having just clear the sidewalk for the bus stop, um, questions of whether the accessibility could be improved at existing locations. Um, There's some drainage issues identified at Irving and Pleasant Street. 
uh, a question about his, and so there's drainage issues there. Uh, there's a concern whether people would, um, would, they would be stepping through water essentially to cross the street to get to the new stop location. Um, a question about historic properties and impacts to them and then existing transit users if um, it would be more difficult for them to get to these new locations or if they would have to walk a little bit further to get to them. On the next slide, these are um, responses to these, these comments. Um, so for the first one about the, this is the schedule for the uh, 67, um, which is I think the, the COVID uh, forging ahead schedule, but the pre-pandemic schedule, which I think it will be getting back to, if not already, then soon. It's twice per hour, but it would still run only on the weekdays and only from 6 a.m. to 8, 8 p.m. So the number of times it would stop would be um, really no more than twice at each stop per hour. But if nobody is waiting or if nobody wants to, needs to get off at that stop, it would not stop. So it would simply pass by as it would otherwise. Um, again, there's improved pedestrian safety at Wellington Street with the existing crosswalk. Um, all of the, <clears throat> I should note that, that these improvements, um, you know, whether they're at the new stops or old stops would improve accessibility, uh, improve curb ramps, um, make other changes to, to make sure that it's accessible for people with disabilities or wheelchairs, add landing pads and so on. Um, this picture here on the right shows the Oak Knoll bus stop at uh, Pleasant Street. And as you can see, there's a tree essentially in the middle of, well, not in the middle of the sidewalk, but it's sort of right in the middle between the curb and the fence there. I believe getting around that, it's maybe three or three and a half feet. So I'm not sure that, that the sidewalk there even meets accessibility guidelines. So in order for the T to make this stop accessible, it might end up with uh, impacts to the street tree, which would require a more complicated process with the tree committee. Um, the proposed stop for this, for Oak Knoll at uh, 93 Pleasant does not have any trees that would be affected. Um, and I believe the other locations don't have any uh, significant tree impacts that are known at this point. Um, the MBTA will upgrade, upgrade the curb ramps at Pleasant Street and Irving Street to try to address some of the water issues that are that were identified and that are there. Uh, and then it's, you know, there was a question about snow clearance. The T would not, cl would not clear these stops. I believe they only commit to clear uh, key bus route stops. The Route 77 in Arlington is one of them. Um, but like any sidewalk, it would need to be cleared per town ordinance, uh, whether there's a bus stop there or not um, by, the, by the abutter. So uh, the requested action, uh, is to approve these proposed locations. Um, I believe that the, you know, moving these is in the public interest and would be a uh, benefit to transit users and to transit service along this route. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Amstutz. And just to let people know, what, what I'm going to do is open it up to questions from the board for Mr. Amstutz. I know there is at least one abutter who wants to be heard. Following the questions to Mr. Amstutz, I will open it up to any abutters who want to uh, provide comments to the board, and then we will take a um, take a vote at that point. So I will start with uh, Mrs. Mahan. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I think my question, or question is probably to at least one of the abutters that is waiting to be heard. So I'm not going to make a motion at this time um, until we do that. But I just wanted to ask. Uh, Mr. Amstutz, um, regarding the, I think it's 93 Pleasant Street. Um, I think it's Amber and John McMahon. Um, if I say that wrong, my last name is Mahan, which is not correct. Um, it, when you, um, the slide of the PowerPoint presentation slide, when you put up, because I know there's concerns on their behalf regarding uh, certain areas in their home, when the, I was viewing, and when I drove by, but when I was viewing what you put up before us, um, there was some sort of frontage before the actual homes in their house appear. I don't know if you can pull that slide up again, but I, I just wanted to ask, you know, is that the case? Because one of their, that I interpreted, sorry, there's a bug flying around. One of their main concerns was um, uh, uh, the bus stopping, and um, people sitting in the bus be, being able to have direct view into the house. So I, I think this is the uh, PowerPoint slide that you presented. 
I, I just wanted to check with Mr. Amstutz, is that 93 Pleasant Street that has the grass and the bush foliage and then the house. Uh, so I think I understand what you're asking. I believe in this picture. So on the left side, I believe that would be the property at 93 Pleasant Street. Um, the bus stop uh, is, the proposed bus stop would be um, not, you know, not from Pelham Terrace, which is the next side street, all the way back to here, but would be, um, the back end of it would be sort of at 87 Pleasant Street. Uh, it couldn't be all the way to the crosswalk because there's a conflict with a fire hydrant there. And, and if you could, um, I, I know you have the cursor or the arrow um, where this particular bus stop is being proposed. Is there any way you could put the cursor or the arrow approximately where 93 Pleasant Street is? Yes, that okay, would be so, Okay, so if you went forward, the bus stop is not in front of their, well, it's in front of the back of their home, but they have the frontage. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. Thank you, thank you Mrs. Mahan. Um, Mr. Diggins. I have no questions for Mr. Assets. I mean, I'm also on um, TAC, I me mean, representing the Chamber of Commerce. So I've been through this. Thank you. Mr. Diggins. Uh, Mr. Hurd. Uh, Mr. Amsterdam answered the question, I, the one question I had about frequency. Um, I certainly am interested in hearing from the board and the any residents that have comment on this. I am, if gonna, if appropriate, gonna move approval, and we can hear further comment before we vote. But you know, I certainly understand some of the concerns that we've received. But as Pleasant Street is all residential properties, it, the bus stops do have to go in front of a property, and I do think that this would be a relatively less frequent stopping bus as I've been the bus before, but I, I will put a motion for to approve out there. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hurd. Mr. Helmuth. Thank you. I, I will second that motion for the purposes of discussion. Um, I, I do want to, before I decide how I want to go on this, I, you know, I do want to hear from the residents and, and other thoughts from my colleagues. Um, I do, I do want to Ask Mr. Amstel, the chair, if I could. Um, one of the residents has suggested just going down a little bit further and putting the, the bus stops in front of the two churches. And my question is: Does the feasibility of that? What you know? What? Um, why not? And and I'm sure there are reasons, but I'd, I'd like to have those laid out so we could consider those. Uh, okay, uh, Mr. Amstel. Yeah, um, I would think I if Sandra. Clary from McMahon. Uh, I don't know if she may have more information about this as they sort of did more of the analysis for deciding to propose it here. But I would say that as you get towards, um, I think it's Maple Street and the churches, mm -hmm. there are a couple of curb cuts and um, for the church that may make it difficult for the um, for the bus to be able to, for the bus stop to be able to get the appropriate uh, length that is in the MBTA guidelines for bus stops. Uh, so I think that that might be an issue, but I'm uh, not 100% sure. Okay. Sure. Um, Mr. Chair, I'd be happy to hear from Ms. Ms. Clary if, if that's your pleasure. Yeah, that, I was just going to do that. Thank you, Mr. Helm. Oh, Ms. You. Clary, if you want to add anything to what Mr. Amstutz said. Sure. Can you hear me? Yes, um, thank you. Okay, <clears throat> it looks like it's muted um, yeah, yeah. on the icon, but it's, it's good. Um, technically, I think the bus stop would fit in front of the churches, but based on our experience in doing this in many communities throughout the bus system, um, typically it's very difficult for the churches to give up the parking, needing it for funerals specifically, as well as masses and kind of having that kind of constant demand on a day-to-day a -day basis as well for, for regular masses and other events. So um, just in our experience, it's tough to relocate a stop in front of a church, even though some of the church goers themselves may use the bus. <laughs> um, 
Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, I believe my colleague, Mr. Diggins, has raised his hand. Would be uh, okay to accommodate his question in the middle well, of the it, night? It, 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 if it's responsive to your question, Mr. Helmuth, otherwise, why don't you finish and then we can go around again? All right. Um, so, yeah, so thank you. Um, did you it, did you actually approach the churches in question to, to ask them about this, uh, about the frontage uh, issue? We have not, not yet. Um, we were hoping with the town support for the current proposals, we were hoping that it would pass tonight. Um, if it doesn't, um, then we would go back to the drawing board, so to speak, um, and we could have a conversation um, yeah. with the church either directly or through the, with the assistance of the planning department um, yeah. to see if that would be feasible. Would the, um, would moving it there create problems with distance between stops or other, uh, Traffic flow. Um, I, just, I don't know if this is a question for you, Ms. Clear, for or for Ms., Mr. Amstutz, but you know, are there any other considerations uh, besides potential frontage issues on the churches that we should be thinking about? Um, I would say the primary thing would be the existing crosswalk. Um, so Daniel already indicated the safety of a bus stopping ahead of a crosswalk, so nobody steps in front of a bus without that good visibility. Um, so moving it in front of the church is moving it that little bit further away from the crosswalk. Um, and there's also a driveway. Um, I just have the, the street view pulled up behind the Zoom here. Um, and there is a driveway. So the bus would be stopping directly in front of the driveway. And there is activity, it looks like pickup drop off directly in front of the church that wouldn't actually be on the street itself. Mr. Emsis, do you wanna comment on that? Uh, yes, just to add to uh, what Ms. Clary is saying, uh, right, the, the concern that I would have with moving it, sliding it towards Maple Street is that it would um, present a situation where the bus would stop before the crosswalk and present a visibility problem for somebody attempting to cross the street. Um, it's something that we, we have run up against in uh, other crosswalks in town. And actually, it was, I believe, two months ago that there was, or one month ago, that was brought to the board a um, request from the police department to um, put up a no parking sign in, uh, I think, just before this crosswalk on the west side of the street. Mm -hmm. I, I believe the board approved that. Um, but that's uh, that's a, just a general safety visibility um, issue that by eliminating cross by, by eliminating the parking or vehicles that would be you know, very difficult to see around you try to eliminate some of the risk associated with the crosswalk thank you um, I think that's it from for now mr chair if you want to move on okay thank you mr Helmuth. mr Diggins did you want to add something to, to that point yes I mean, and so it's been my experience I mean uh, that uh, when it comes to parking and churches it can be hard to keep the bus stops clear. Uh, when, um, like before service and after service, when there are lots of people dropping off and picking up people. Uh, so, so that would be one of the reasons I would think that putting it in front of a church uh, would not be a good idea. Okay. Thank, thank you, Mr. Diggins. I have a couple questions. And then, as I said, I will open it up to a butters. Two uh, things. First, on the the size of the bus stop, I believe it's it's 85 feet now. Is that is that a new standard of the MBTA, or if you could just maybe clarify what the length of each each one of the proposed bus stops is and what it had been previously? Because I think it, it, there was no nothing really laid out at a couple of those stops. Yeah, the bus stop length does vary depending on where it is relative to the intersection. Generally, if it's a far side stop um, ahead of a crosswalk. If there's no driveways or anything, but there is a parking lane, it would be 60 feet long. If it's at the near side of an intersection before the crosswalk, it needs 90. And if it's at mid block, it's 100. And they are all minimums. Um, ideally, the T would like another 20 feet on top of all that. <laughs> um, but if we have driveways, hydrants, you know, depending on um, the actual site conditions, there's a little bit of um, flexibility and variation with those lengths. Okay, all right. I, just, I thought I saw 85 somewhere, but uh, there's four different numbers that, uh, that that we have out there now. And just a question, maybe for Mr. Amstutz, I don't know. Um, the question of bus shelters, right now the T is not proposing any bus shelters. 
Can the approval be conditioned that there be no bus shelters at these stops or once we approve it, the T has discretion to add a shelter? So I'm sorry, the question is to condition that there would be no bus shelters proposed here. Uh, yeah, that's right. I mean, that's that's one of the concerns and, and we'll hear from the right. butters in a second, but I mean, I'm just wondering if there, other than approving the bus stop, if there are any conditions that can be put on the use of the stop, uh, namely uh, you know, whether or not a shelter can be put there. Um, I, I would say that, um, for bus shelters, I know that there isn't one that's being uh, proposed here right now, um, but I believe the. I'm not sure that at this point that this stop would uh, sort of meet. I, I mean, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if these the shelters sort of need to meet thresholds in terms of the uh, um, number of borders and I mean number of users at that stop. But I think, sorry, I think <laughs> either Sandra, um, I think Sandra. Uh -huh. Or not? Is that Natasha there? Maybe yeah, I'll hi, hi Daniel. Natasha, go ahead. I was just going to call on <laughs> Sandra again because you must be using her computer. But go, go right ahead. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure what happened there. I'm sorry. I'm Natasha Vance. I'm with the MBTA. I'm the Transit Project Manager for the Patty Project. Um, so to respond to your question about the shelters, um, no, we would not install shelters without um, Arlington's express approval. Um, and typically, we put shelters in in places with much higher ridership. Um, than these stops. So certainly if that was a condition, um, I don't, the T would not have any issue with that. Okay, th th thank you very much. Okay, so at this point, I, I'm gonna open it up to any abutters who want to uh, speak. I believe Mr. and Mrs. McMahon are on, um, are on the list to speak. I don't think there's anybody else. So if they can join us now, um, be happy to hear from them. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> yeah. Can you hear us and see us? <laughs> yeah, yes, we can. Yeah. So you can give us your name and address, and and um, we did receive written materials from you. But if you want to just lay out your concerns uh, for the board, sure. Um, I'm Amber McMahon from 93 Pleasant Street, and I'm John McMahon. Um, I know you've received our personal concerns and our concern for public safety. Um, and thank you for allowing us the time to voice those concerns this evening. Um, you know, beyond our personal concerns and our front of the house is actually right on Pleasant Street. The back of our house is Pelham Terrace. Um, the bushes that you saw have been pruned back. So we um, are constantly outside in our kitchen and bedrooms face Pleasant Street. So we um, have the ability to observe daily what goes on. Um, I think we all share the same concern for public safety of pedestrians, children, um, and that everyone get the access that they need. My main concern is how dangerous the traffic is right in front of our home um, with Wellington directly across the street. Almost daily, there are accidents that take place. We actually have video footage from our ring that records out front um, of cars that come up Wellington Street and they go to take that left. And where um, I believe this bus stop is being proposed to stop. And this is, so it's hugely dangerous. Um, I, I can't express how dangerous this is for cars, the bus riders, civilians, pedestrians, um, with the cars that come up Wellington during you know, it's not only rush just hour. rush hour, but it's all day long. And we have video footage from Monday evening with this near 
accidents occurring um, that I could share, but I don't have to, but could do that with you. Um, I, I can't hear you, Mr. McMahon. Uh, okay. I'm not done. With the um, church parking, they park up and down our street. They park all over. And on I'm Pleasant, Pelham. they park even like there's a no parking sign right before you go out onto Pleasant Street from Pelham, and they park before that, which makes it even impossible for us to, to even pull, see to pull out. To pull out, taking a left or a right, you can't see the car. And pick up and drop off of the church is on Maple Street. The, for the, the preschool where the Verizon um, building so is. you know i know that we want this to be safe and we we all care about the safety and accessibility i'm just really concerned that this is a potential dangerous or deadly situation during these times for bus riders pedestrians um cars involved, children. Also, the sidewalk, there have been, that's right in front of our house. Um, we witness people who are walking and running have injuries. There's been cones placed out there from quite some time due to someone who tripped because of the trees and the sidewalk is very uneven. So, you know, I know we voiced and wrote our personal concerns. I just, safety is the main concern here. And I do not want to see someone get hurt, injured, killed. I mean, we see Pleasant Street all day long. Our kitchen is right there. So, we're all the time. and we're outside all the time. So, our concern is the well being, safety of the citizens, and public safety of Arlington. I've been a citizen for my entire life. So, thank, 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 thank you for your comments. I, I am going to now turn it back to the board for any further questions or, or comments. Um, and I'll go in the same order that I went previously. Mrs. Mahan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I understand there's a motion by Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mr. Helmet, originally for discussion only. Um, uh, I do support that. Um, I honestly pay attention to accident reports um, everywhere in Arlington, um, just by my memory, and I don't know if, and I don't expect Mr. Amstutz would have this, but um, at the intersection of Pleasant Street and Wellington, I can't think of in the past year where there's been an accident. I know that um, it was said it's almost daily. Um, but there's it's daily close close encounters. <laughs> Mr. McMahon, excuse me for one second. If if you could mute your microphone while Mrs. Mahana is speaking, and then we'll work questions through me. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I'm just making my case to my colleagues um, uh, and and asking um, if through the chair, Mr. Amstead has that information, but I honestly can't think of in the past year an accident at Pleasant and Wellington Street that resulted in a pedestrian death versus many years before that. Um, and in terms of, um, I'm prepared to vote on the recommendation from um, planning department and I would uh, agree with uh, Mr. Hurd's motion seconded by Mr. Helmer. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Uh, Mr. Diggins, any further questions or comments? Um, no, not not really. You know, he, all I'd say is that he, should we go through with this, we, we can certainly keep a close eye on the situation uh, to uh, to pay attention to safety concerns. Uh, yeah, I know that he, if um, there were to, if problems, unexpected problems or expected problems were to materialize in the MBTA, uh, would listen to our concerns. I, mean, I happen to uh, take a look at some of the bus stop data through the data portal on the MBTA um, website yesterday because um, I don't know if you know this, Matasha, but I'm on the MBTA Rider Rosa Committee and I was in a, a, a marketing communications operation uh, committee, subcommittee meeting yesterday and we were talking about um, bus stops feed and looking at this one, I mean, the, the um, 
it's very the the people getting on or off are, are it's, it's very low. I mean, it's almost enough to make me think that uh, the bus doesn't stop there uh, all the time. Uh, and so, uh, given that a I know how much effort the MBTA puts into this. I mean, TAC looked at it, and, and we can look at this after it's implemented and advocate for change uh, if necessary. I'm going to support it too. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Uh, Mr. Hurd. Um, yeah, I sort of reiterate what I had said before. Is I actually, because of the way my office is oriented, I go take Wellington every day when I come home and I take a left onto Pleasant Street. So it certainly is, it's not the safest intersection in Arlington, but I don't think that putting a bus there particularly makes it more dangerous. If anything, it will slow the traffic down coming from the Mass Ave direction on Pleasant Street. Um, and I do have, just in regards to putting the bus stop closer to the church, the Maple crosswalk is one that I think is really concerning. If you put a bus there straddling two crosswalks, then it's a recipe for disaster. So like I said, I mean, it's not an ideal situation and I don't think anybody wants a bus stop in front of their house, but you know, we have to put the bus stops on Pleasant Street. And I don't think that this will be a high stopping area on Pleasant Street for the one bus that goes down. So I will support my motion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Mr. Helmuth. Uh, thank you. I have a question. Uh, I'm just referring to Ms. Vance's uh, memo to us, uh, and I appreciate the work that went into that. It referred to, uh, to final approvals uh, after the 100% design. So this is just a question for you, Mr. Chair. Um, so what we're doing tonight, are we, is this the final approval from the select board and that uh, for these uh, to be moved or would we be, uh, approving this, would we be doing the final approvals after the design is complete? Mr. Helmuth, I, I, I'd like to refer that to Mr. Amps. It's my understanding if tonight is our final approval and there would be further oversight of, of the plans, but if, if Mr. Amstutz or um, anybody else could confirm that for me. I mean, the, the motion or the, the action here is actually relocating the bus stops. Um, I believe that the, you know, well, essentially the, the T and their consultant would, they've created 30% design plans. So not, not fully designed yet, but needed to have confirmation from the town in order to move ahead with the making 100% construction plans for these locations. So they you know, didn't want to get too far ahead. Uh, so this is, uh, the actual relocation so that the T can continue on with their design. And then I believe it, you know, once they finish that, they would actually work with the uh, public works department to get authorization for the construction, uh, work with the construction management and so on. Um, but if, if uh, Natasha or Sandra can add anything to that, that's at your discretion. Sure, anything else to add on that? Uh, no, Daniel is exactly correct. We're at 30% plans. If you all approve the relocation, we'll finalize the design. Um, we'll and we'll certainly return that to our, the town of Arlington to confirm um, everything looks good. And then of course our contractor would get a construction permit um, and would notify abutters two weeks before uh, construction would start. Um, and just for everyone's information, um, it typically takes somewhere between five to 10 days to construct one of these stops. It's a, it's a very simple construction process, curb ramps, sidewalks, repainting the crosswalk, that kind of thing. So it's a very quick and not tremendously disruptive construction process. Yeah. Thank you, that, that's helpful. So yeah, I just want clar clarity that what, on what we're actually voting on tonight. Um, you know, I, 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 on this, I think I will defer to my more experienced colleagues, both in terms of transportation and service on the board, um, but I did you know, carefully read all the materials that were sent to us carefully read the concerns of, of the abutters and you know I, I really feel for them um, for those concerns and I think for me it comes down to making a judgment about um, about safety and I, I personally find just to speak to my colleagues that the um, Mr. Amstutz case for you know no, no perfect solutions here um, but the alternatives that I, I don't see alternatives that are safer or better um, than what's being proposed so 
I think you know understanding that uh, it has the impacts that it has on 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 butters and just the reality of being on Pleasant Street. Um, I am prepared to support the motion. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Helmuth. And just a couple of comments. And originally, when and I appreciate the materials that were prepared by Mr. Amstutz and by the MBTA and the comments that we received from Mr. And Mrs. McMahon, I did it, it first thought that the proposed relocation was actually to the corner of um, Pelham Terrace in, in Pleasant Street, right in front of the McMahon's house. It actually is closer to the crosswalk and in a, in a part of this bus stop is actually in front of 87 Pleasant Street. And as Mr. Helmuth said, there's no perfect answers here, but I do think that one of the goals here is to move these stops closer to crosswalks where you're encouraging pedestrians to leave a bus and, and exit behind the bus if you're, if you're going to cross. And, and one thing I would say from uh, the, the comments that the McMahons made tonight, there may be issues here that have to do with things other than the, the bus stop and, and that, that turn from Wellington onto Pleasant Street. That, that At that hour, at the end of the day, the bus is heading into Alewife. They're, they're not, there's not a lot of ridership on those. That, that's, that issue on the left turn might be a traffic issue. I don't see it so much as a, as a bus stop issue um, across the street and, and the parking with the church too. That might be an issue between um, the church and, and you know, enforcement of what we do for parking. And maybe that's something that we look into apart from this, not, not so much the select board, but the town, if there are issues where people are parking. So I'm inclined to go along with the, the, the motion as well. I appreciate the comments and I think we will um, watch this as it progresses. And if there are concerns, we, we would like to hear from you on that. So uh, with a motion, um, from Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mr. Helmuth for approval. Uh, Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. Jacorsi. Yes. It's unanimous vote. Thank, thank you for, for coming this evening. Next item. Thank you. Item Thanks for your time. Okay, thank you. Uh, next item, item number 10, discussion and approval, constable appointment process, uh, Mr. Chapdelaine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as the, some board members might be aware, um, we once had a number of constables approved in the town and we're now down to, I believe, one uh, approved constable, which puts some pressure on the workload for attorneys across town. The board is the official appointing authority for constables. Uh, I have received a number of applications over the past several months, and I simply wanted to offer to the board tonight, uh, offer slash ask for approval to review those applications and come back to the, uh, to the board, hopefully at its next meeting, with a recommendation for approval of up to three new constables. I say up to because if you know, if, if there's not enough qualified applicants, I might not come back with three, but I'm, I was looking for the board's authorization to review, interview, and come back and propose the approval or appointment of up to three constables. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chapterling. Um, turn it to the board, Mr. Helmuth. Um, thank you. So for the benefit of those watching, and if I'm really honest, for my benefit, what do constables do in Arlington? So my, my limited understanding, and I'm guessing Mr. Hurd uh, could answer this uh, better than I could, is they, they deliver legal service uh, to people at their homes or businesses in Arlington on behalf of attorneys and the courts as well. Mr. Hurd, is that accurate? Yeah. So, I, I mean, the main thing that you used for in Arlington was delivery of process and summary process and eviction actions. But... They can also, in certain instances, bond, constables are bonded. And in rare cases, a constable can actually be used to remove somebody from a property. Um, so it does take some sort of a selection process to make sure that you have the right person. But, um, you know, I'll wait for my turn to speak on this. But yeah, the 99% of what they do is just serve legal documents on residents. 
Thank you. Um, and, and Mr. Chair, just for my clarity, is this is this an action before us right now? Is this uh, that you need a motion for? Or is this informational? No, it, 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 it's both informational and a motion. It, 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 Mr. Chapter Line is looking for authorization to conduct an interview process and come back to us for approval of right. constables. Oh, sure. Yeah, I'm very happy to, to make that motion. Uh, okay. Thank you. No, no further questions. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Mrs. Mahan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I will second that and uh, I will ask the chair, the town manager, or my colleague, Attorney Hart. I don't want to get like the school committee where everyone's called attorney something. Because um, <laughs> I certainly can't be called attorney. But um, am I correct in terms of the constable that they do play a role in elections in some way in terms of uh, appointing? Uh, or having a vote in Democrat or Republican. I, I'm, I'm thinking of a gentleman whose last name is Boyk. Um, I understand their delivery, legal delivery uh, job duties, but I, am I correct that they're also somehow involved in elections or town appointments regarding Republican and or Democratic um, appointees to the board of registrars. Uh, Attorney Heim, do you know the answer to that? Or so, a um, couple things. One, uh, constables do um, can be used to uh, secure ballots, although I think in most cases we use. Uh, a police officer stationed at polling stations, but they have the ability, um, they have the ability to be involved in elections that way. Um, I apologize, I'm not familiar with their role with respect to the board of registrars. Um, apologize, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with that specific uh, piece of chair. Can I just add something? Sure, Mr. Hurd. Um, so Joe Boyk was on the Board of Registrars. I don't think he was ever a constable. That's right. Oh. OK. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry. So I didn't mean to confuse people. I just had in my head, I'm thinking of Bill Forrestal and things that, you know, from previous. So I'm sorry. I'm misremembering. So uh, Mr. thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Thank Chair, you. may I add one thing? Sure. Our constables also uh, traditionally help us uh, with our town meeting warrants. It's another way that we oftentimes see them all over town. Okay, thank, thank you, Attorney Ham. Uh, Mr. Hurd. Yeah, I would just say, <laughs> I don't use constables much anymore, but when I did, I, I griped a little bit about the lack of constables and not, nothing against the constables that we had. And, you know, Mr. Boyle was certainly had long service to this town and May he rest in peace. I was sad to hear of his passing. Um, and then we had a few that moved out. So it, even before I was on the select board, I was on the select board's office to try to get some more constables um, in town. One thing I just note, and if we, I certainly would keep the recommendation to see it, who Mr. Chaplin can receive in town. Um, I know I've, had connections with certain constable services that have serve in 25 cities and towns but arlington requires that the constables be residents i don't know if that's a bylaw attorney heim but we i'm certainly would like to open this up to town residents first and if we get qualified applicants from town residents but so that would be something to look at if we don't have sufficient applicants for constables as to whether or not we want to open that up beyond the the uh, restrictions of residents in town, because there are a few services that are very reliable and provide professional constable services, and they're more suited than just town residents to, if it's not simply a service of process, if it's a more hands-on task, some of the professional constable services are um, better situated to, to handle those situations. So 
I'm not asking for any action now. I just want to put that out there. If in fact we do not receive a su sufficient number of applicants, that's something that we may want to look at. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Uh, Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I guess it's kind of along the lines of uh, uh, what Mr. Helmuth asked. So what's not being done now because we don't have enough constables? This would be, a, I guess, no, that's a, query, a question. I, 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 I think it's a shortage, but Mr. Chapel, if you want to comment on that. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah. So yeah, my understanding is that because of the shortage, when attorneys are looking to have legal service or legal documents delivered, they, they might not as read, the constables might not be as readily available as if we had a few more named. Okay. Um, and, 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 and how much, how much should we pay them? So Approximately. We, we, we do not pay them. They're, they're paid by the private attorneys. Oh, okay. So it doesn't even cost a ton of anything. That's good. Yeah. You know, so, all right. Um, so, all right. I'm getting a better handle on this. Uh, all right. And I was, I was going to prove it anyways. I was just kind of curious. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. And, and I, I think Mr. Hurd, thank you for um, going into some additional detail on the, on the constables, but I always look at it as a, as a due process type situation with the constable that they, they provide proof of service and um, and, and notice of, of pending legal action. And, and so it's the party that uses the constable that, that is paying for it. So um, we have a motion by Mr. Helmuth, seconded by Mrs. Mahan um, for the procedure that the town manager laid out. Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. Corsi? Yes. Shannon's vote. Thank you. Uh, next item, item 11 for approval, short-term rental application for board office use. Uh, Attorney Heim. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be really brief. Um, the town passed a short-term bylaw, uh, short-term rental bylaw regulation, obviously the past 14 or 18 months or whatever it's been. Uh, Short-term rentals have not been at the forefront of most people's minds. But uh, the reason I'm putting this in for you, before you, it's, it's not necessarily even because uh, it's strictly necessary. Our, our bylaw basically allows us to ask for some additional information uh, over and above the provisions of the bylaw that I transmitted to you. I'm really just looking for the board's approval for this um, application process, which I'd like to have posted on the town's website along with some links to the state's requirements. So it's a little bit clearer uh, what exactly folks should be doing when they wanna uh, submit a, um, when they, when they want to uh, operate a short-term rental in Arlington. Obviously this discussion came a lot, up a lot in the ADU context. I wanna make it very clear that one of the things that's very explicit in this is that uh, short-term rentals uh, may not be placed in accessory dwelling units. There's also a bunch of other restrictions uh, and an attempt to sort of bring together in one place um, the things that folks would need to affirm they're in compliance with the Arlington Health Code, uh, food safe certification if they're serving meals, the state sanitary code, building code, the Arlington zoning bylaw, all that kind of stuff. Um, that they haven't had any violations uh, in the last, um, oh, I'm sorry, I forget the uh, period of time, but they haven't had any violations within the period of time that will uh, prohibit them from opening a short term rental. Um, as per the town bylaw. So I, I really just wanted to make sure that the board uh, felt like this was a good uh, sort of way of, of processing uh, our short-term rental applications, which are gonna be administered by your office. They're not gonna come to you unless there's a problem and a short-term rental needs to be um, suspended or have their short-term rental sort of license revoked based on violations. That if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you, Attorney Hunt. Uh, Mr. Hurd. I guess I just asked Attorney Hunt just for so I can wrap my head around the term short term rental. Is this, for lack of a better word, the Airbnb type of rental situation? That's right. Airbnb, VR, VRBO, um, Home Away. They're basically uh, rentals that are primarily oriented around vacations. 
uh, and they have to be less than 31 days after, under state law. They also have to be registered uh, with the state Department of Revenue if they're um, being used for more than a certain number of days a year and they need to carry a certain type of insurance by state law uh, for sort of general liability. Our own bylaws put some additional um, requirements on them as well as a bunch of other common sense thing that we sort of cultivated from uh, different departments like there should be fire extinguishers available, things like that, recommendations to the fire department. Uh, Peter Buckley from my office helped to collect a lot of this information and we're grateful for this help on this. Thank you. With that, I will move approval of the application as presented by Attorney Heim. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Mr. Diggins. I, I will second it, Adam, and question through you to um, uh, uh, Mr. Heim. Maybe just a general kind of question or comment. I'm always curious when um, people have to verify that they're having, or they have to state that there hasn't been any violations or anything like that. I'm, I'm just kind of curious as to why we don't just check that ourselves because we, if whatever number they say, I mean, whether they say zero or whatever, I mean, we'll have to confirm that, no? Attorney Han? Um, frankly, I, I think that sometimes it's easier to check uh, certain uh, databases than it is others. So for example, it's probably a little bit easier to check uh, with the um, Arlington Police Department about noise complaints than it might be about certain other types of um, violations for uh, you know, disposal of, of trash or something like that. I also think it's important sometimes to put the affirmative duty upon an applicant um, to sort of do their homework and understand that they're being asked to uh, attest to something. And if they're found to be in violation of that, I think it's probative, maybe not determinative for the board that someone's made a representation that they couldn't ultimately back up. Thank you. That's it, Mr. Chair, thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Diggins. Uh, Mr. Helmuth. Uh, thank you, no questions. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Um, thank you, Ms. <clears throat> excuse me, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm not trying to sort of mess everything this up, but since this is short-term rental, um, my question to the chair and or Attorney Heim um, centers around uh, Section 5B, the review of complaints. It says within 30 days of receipt, it goes to the select board, we refer it somewhere else. Um, I'm thinking of my own street that we have two families that have been turned into condos. And, you know, when someone plays loud, loud music or smokes weed and the other apartment doesn't like it, that's a nightmare for the police in the town as, as it is. Um, what I'd like to ask uh, Attorney Time, is there any way we can expedite under the review of complaint uh, process? Right now it says within 30 days, the select board reviews the complaint and refers it to the appropriate town department and then makes a determination and so on and so forth. Is there any way can, we can expedite, expedite that that says um, within something like five business days after receipt of the complaint, the appropriate town department official board or commission um, will review for findings. Um, and after that, it's, it's kind of vague about, about what the language says, but it says, I guess, after those entities find a potential finding the select board or its designee will see if it's a violation of a short-term rental. Um, so if I had my brothers, it would be within five business days of a complaint, um, the appropriate town department board or commission um, will review the complaint and the select board or its designee will serve notice upon the operator of the short-term rental. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm floundering here a little. So I guess I'm well, going to ask Attorney Hine if you can help me on that. Uh, sure. So thank you, uh, uh, Mrs. Mahan. 
I, I certainly think um, that we can, that sort of timeline is in there to, in the, in the bylaws to sort of reflect that there are going to be times in which the board say in the summer session can't necessarily easily um, meet um, things that might not coincide with your regularly uh, scheduled activities. But I don't think that that means that the town boards and commission, uh, town boards and, and, and official, I'm sorry, that, town officials um, or other boards can't meet before then and make um, a uh, recommendation to the board or make their findings before the board meets. In other words, let's say it's a noise violation, the police can kind of report that to you right away. They don't necessarily need somebody else to do that. But if there's a board of health violation, um, I think that the board of health could meet before you do um, to expedite that process. Sure, I mean, th this is in the bylaw, but we, we, we can, we can uh, figure out ways to expedite reviews of the complaint so that when it's getting to the select board, it's um, at its sort of final stage, not just at the beginning. I, I, I hear that, yeah. Okay, and uh, you, you definitely get it. What, what I'm saying is, it, it right now says within 30 days of the select board receiving the complaint that it could be up to 30 days for us to receive it. And I kind of want, once the complaint comes in, because it's saying within 30 days, we refer to the appropriate town departments, Board of Health, Police Chief, Fire Chief, or Fire Department, and then it comes back to us. I'd like to you know, get rid of that 30 days that once we receive it, it goes to the appropriate town department, and then it comes back to the board. It doesn't have to wait 30 days to come to the board to begin the clock ticking. Yeah, Mr. Does that Mr. Make Mr. Chairman? Sure. Yeah, yes, Ms. Vaughn, it does, it does make sense. I mean, this is, we, we could amend the bylaw to change that time frame, but I think that the bylaw leaves us enough leeway that we could operate in a much faster response time so that what the board is really doing within 30 days is taking an action. The only thing that the board can't do is make a determination that's under somebody else's jurisdiction about whether or not something is a violation of the state stand territory, for example. But if you're armed with the information you need, you could take action much swifter than, than, than the timeline that would seem to be suggested. I, yes. So I guess I would ask who the chair, if I think there was a motion by Mr. Helmuth, or was it Mr. Hart? Whoever made the motion and seconded it, if they could take that as a friendly amendment. Yeah, and, and just the, the one thing on that, Mrs. Mahan, is, that we we can't change the bylaw. I think we can, and, and I'm not sure there's anything in the application process that addresses 30 days. We certainly can do something administratively within the select board office that if we receive a complaint, it could be our policy that we forward it to the appropriate department upon receipt. But the uh, the bylaw that Attorney Heim referenced is, is what town meeting approved back in 2019. So we're that, that is what it is for now. Um, it does give us time, but I think administratively we can try to accomplish what 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 you're saying in terms of doing things in in notifying other departments and taking action quicker. Is that uh, Attorney Heim? I don't know if you have anything further on that. I think that's what I'm receiving Ms. Mahan's uh, amendment to be is that she'd like there to be some sort of reflection in in the um, in the what we're going to put together when we sort of advertise this that you know the select board will essentially you know uh hear complaints as soon as possible um you know and that the, that 30 days is the sort of maximum timeline it has to you know have a hearing on something does that does that make sense mr DeCourcy? I, I think yeah no absolutely so i i think that's something we can do out of our office or out of the select board we can come back on that, I don't think it's anything that has to change on the application. And, and again, I think the bylaw having that period gives us an outside date in case there's something that comes up, but we certainly can act quicker and, and get notice yeah. out on that as well. And, and I could, if I could, Mr. Chair, I just wanna ask you to make sure that 
my interpretation is it says within 30 days um, after the receipt of a complaint, the board to take whatever action. And I think what you're guiding me on and I agree with is, um, yes, it's within 30 days, but I don't feel it needs to take 30 days. And uh, the select board office, we can set up a process that hopefully it can get done perhaps within five business days um, to begin the referral process to have the appropriate town departments look at it and then it comes back to the select board for us to uh, make an adjudication on it. So do you think that's okay under the uh, town bylaw, the town meeting bylaw that was passed that we can have 30 days, but we're choosing not to take 30 days. My thing is it's a beginning process. It shouldn't take 30 days. Can we get it done in five days? No, I, I, I agree with you. I mean, I think we look at the bylaws as an outside date, but I think as a practice, once we get this underway, and we start receiving applications in, it can be our practice within our select board office. And depending on the timing of our meetings that we can act uh, much quicker than the 30 days. And I think that's up to us to do that. And we can be in compliance with the, the, the bylaw. If we did in one day, we're in compliance with the bylaw. So I think, I think internally we can take care of that. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you to my colleagues. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Um, and I have no further um, comments on this. So on a motion by Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mr. Diggins uh, for approval, Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmet. Yep. Mrs. Mahan. Yeah, thank you. And Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Sam Ms. Hill. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Um, okay, next item, item 12 for discussion, future select board meetings. I'm just pulling out the calendar. So right now we have a meeting scheduled for June 21st. We don't have anything scheduled in July, August or September. I was thinking we would go out three months here. Um, typically we have one meeting in July, one meeting in August, and then we would be back to two in September. I just want to let people know the middle of the month to, to July 12th might be a candidate. I have a, I have conflicts on the 12th and 14th of that week. So um, if, if, as we look through it, if you could take a look at your calendars, that's, um, I just wanted to put that out there. So if anybody has proposals for dates, I, I'm not going to call on people individually. If you want to just propose something, um, I, I, I can do that. I'm looking in the first instance for the week of July 19th, if, if people are comfortable with that, and that doesn't run too far after the end of the fiscal year for Mr. Chapterlane in terms of anything that we may need to do at the end of the fiscal year or shortly afterwards. Um, if I could share the, for me, the 19th um, looks fine and I'll leave it to you and Mr. Helmuth about what our meetings going forward look like. But the other thing that I would um, present or pose to you is that usually in July, sometimes in August, on a Saturday morning, from like 9 to 11, sometimes a little bit later than that, we have a select board and town manager goals meeting, which is separate from our July select board meeting. So maybe after you choose the July and August select board meeting that we go back and, and pick a date in July and or August, um, depending on what you and my colleagues want to do. Normally it's in July. It's normally on a Saturday. Um, I don't want to do it on a Sunday. Sometimes it's been on a Thursday. Um, but I, so I want to do the regular business meeting in July and August and then do our select board and town manager uh, goals meeting. So I'm okay with the 19th and thank you. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Mahan. And, and one thing I, I may suggest, if we could select the regular meetings with the understanding that we need to come back and select a, that the meeting you discussed and maybe we can discuss that at our June 21st meeting to have a date on, on that, that would, I, I think that would work. Um, okay, so July 19th works for two of us. Is, is July 19th good for the other members on the board? Okay. Right. Mr. Hurd? I believe so. Okay, all right, thank you. So let's let's select that date. 
August, is there a, um, any particular dates that work for, for members? At this point, they're all open for me. Same. Okay, 16th. I believe, I think we are away on the, the week of the 16th. Okay. Um, um, maybe the week of the 9th, because um, I think if, once we get towards the end of the month, it's getting a little late there. So the 9th or the 11th? The 9th should be fine. Not the 11th, you yeah. know. Okay, that's fine. Night. How's, how's the ninth? That's fine. Okay. But that good thing, Mr. Chairman. Okay, the ninth is good for you, Mrs. Mahan? Yes, thank you. Okay, all right. In September, Labor Day is the sixth. Um, so if we were to do something that first week, I think we'd have to do the, the Wednesday, the eighth, and maybe something the week of the 20th. But just want to see if, if people want to wait another week. That that's fine with me too. The second Wednesdays of the month are, are really bad for me. It's tacked for one thing, but I'm just stacked on the second Wednesday of the month. Uh, okay. I mean, I did this one because it was you know, extenuating circumstances, yeah, but uh, this was not a good night for me to do this. Okay. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, I was going to say yes to the eighth, but I think Mr. Diggins is saying no to that. My, my only concern is um, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Sometimes both of them occur in September. Sometimes it's September, October. And the calendar that I have pulled up doesn't say where those dates are. If any of my colleagues have those dates or if we want to wait till our, our next to set that. Yeah, I, my calendar, I, I don't have it either. Uh, Rosh Hashanah is on September 7th. And okay. Yom, Yom Kippur starts the 15th. Can someone say that again? I heard seven and 13, but I, I just want to hear the dates because sometimes seven, but the night before is sundown. So what was seven and 13? Or, or is it 15, seven and 15? 15. Rosh Hashanah starts the evening of the sixth and ends the evening of the eighth. Okay. Oh. And then Yom Kippur uh, begins the evening on the 15th and uh, ends the Thursday the 16th. Okay. So. So we could do the 13th and the 27th if that works for people. Okay. Yes, thanks. Okay, all right, so that's what we'll do. So just for, for Lauren, Lauren's benefit, July 19th, August 9th, September 13th, and September 27th. Great. Thank you. All right, next item, item 13, correspondence received, report, website and communication survey, Joan Roman, public information officer. Mr. Chapdelin, did you want to, I don't know if you want to talk on this before we move very, to your... Very briefly, thank you, Mr. Chairman, that I wanted to make sure the board had an opportunity to see this and receive it in public session. Uh, it gives both very positive feedback of the town's recent communication efforts and the refresh of the town website, and also guides us in where we can continue to make improvement so I didn't need any action from the board, but I thought the board would want to um, be able to receive it in public session, and then we'll share it uh, more broadly with the public as well. Thank you very much. Any um, comments, questions, or motion from, from the board, Mr. Helmuth? Um, thank you. Yeah, I'd like to move uh, move receipt. Is that the appropriate motion? Yes. Yeah, thank you. And, uh, and I, I want to thank the, uh, the, the town manager and, and Ms. Roman for, for the excellent work. I actually read the, the entire report and um, really appreciated the attention to, to uh, holding ourselves accountable to metrics and noting where we've seen uh, improvements in, in use. And I think we're asking good questions about real tasks that people need to, from their website um, and also uh, being very open about, about improvements that we need. And, and I also really do appreciate the recent redesign of the website. It's, it was a big improvement for mobile. And I think that's really important given given how many people um, are primarily mobile day-to-day -day on, on the internet. Um, the one thing I just wanted to, to just mention to the town manager, uh, to possibly take a note, is I think the report did, did observe that one area that we'd like to see some improvement on is the number of people who are subscribed to town email notices. Um, and you know, I think it correctly pointed out that we have a lot of households and we have you know, lower than you might expect 
uh, fraction of those people. And um, and this is not a for an answer tonight, but my, I think my question would be, you know, can we think about some strategies to understand why that is and how we might be able to improve those? Um, not and not just publicity, but are the things that we can do on the sign up page itself uh, for that site? Because I, my my suspicion is that it may not be as clear as it could be how you actually uh, do that. And I know that there are some technical uh, reason uh, limitations with with the vendor there, but but that just something something to look at. It's, it may be already something that, that that's in progress. And and again, I you know I, I point out that one thing because the report did. Um, that is, I think, something that it's such a, the email notices are so good. The content and the frequency is, for, I think, we saw from responses in the survey exactly right. So I would love to, to get more, uh, more, more people to, uh, to take advantage of that. And if we can spend a little time figuring out how we can improve the, the, um, the awareness and visibility of that, that might, that might be something worth doing uh, at your discretion. But, but overall, just congratulations. I think it was just really fine work. And um, and I have to say, I look at a lot of municipal websites and I, I'm really confident that ours is, is one of the best out there in the Commonwealth. And I, I appreciate the, the time and the attention that goes uh, into it. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Uh, Mr. Diggins. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Aiden. So uh, I, um, I agree with Mr. Helmuth. Uh, I did note though that that um, apparently the mobile usage was low. And, uh, so as much as people may be on their phones on other websites, they aren't on ours. And, uh, uh, and, and uh, it's not really clear what we can do about that in terms of getting people um, uh, to sign up more. That may be something for the Standing Committee and Vision Arlington Standing Committee to take up as one other way to get at people, not to say, um, not to do what you suggested. Uh, and um, uh, is, would, do you think there would be any chance that uh, Ms. Roman would like to come and have a little chat with us, Mr. Um, Mr. Um, chapter line through you, Mr. Chair? Sure. Sure, if the board would like to entertain that as an agenda item, she'd be happy to come, absolutely. Okay, great. Uh, and uh, and, and uh, like Mr. Helmets, I, I spent some time going through municipal websites. I was looking for some information for the Rainbow Coalition and I'm going through them again now in preparation for um, uh, the Youth and Young Adult uh, Study um, Group. Uh, and uh, ours is very good. I mean, uh, uh, the the one thing I would say uh, is, is the calendar. I mean, I find that those that have the calendar, when you land on the page, if you see the calendar, you don't miss it. You know, with ours, you have to scroll down a little bit. And and the SEO may be such that there are people who just punch calendar into the search um, space and then expect to find the calendar on our site and and, uh, and I don't know what you can do about SEO to make them like then see you know the main calendar uh, but that would be my only suggestion for maybe an improvement to the site just make it such that you see the calendar first thank you thank you Mr. Diggins Mr. Hurd just like to reiterate thanks to all that was involved in the process and no further comments Mr. Hurd, Mrs. Mahan. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would echo my colleague, Mr. Diggins', Diggins remarks on um, the community calendar feature, which previously, when you went on the town website, was like one of the main option features that you could click on. Now you really have to dig to get it. And I, I did send an email to Ms. Roman about this, who told me it's still just as easy to get but it's not um and then um whether it's a agenda item with miss roman coming in or i'm okay with comments being passed on to her the um report we got on the website survey i would say 80 to 90 percent focuses around covid 19 information which is very important um but I have heard, and I forwarded the emails um, to Joan Roman and CC the town manager about town residents that felt previously they could get information on the town website, and now they're having difficulty finding it. 
So um, I'm not asking that specifically, Ms. Roman, come to a select board meeting, but since Mr. Diggins has raised, raised the possibility, I'd be okay with it. But I would ask, I know I've sent at least eight to 11 emails to Ms. Roman and CC, the town manager, about people talking about the website that they could find information before and they can't not now, um, that maybe we could kind of uh, look at that and, and have an answer to that. Because I know myself, even, I, I remember initially, I could go right on the community calendar to find all the meetings. And now you can't do that anymore. You have to go to each individual department, whether it's town government, whether it's a town department, and then you need to go into their particular meeting. I, I, my thing would be, I feel some of the features originally on a town website, which included, um, especially around meetings, uh, you could just click on that as well as um, before on the town website, you could click on uh, basically new news. Um, and you can't do that now. You need to click on an individual department or an individual board or government board and then click on uh, I, I like the feature from before that when you went to the main website you could click on new news you could click on community meetings um and uh, I, I can find it now because i know i need to hunt for it but um other people who aren't as savvy that that will hang in there i i feel those two features in terms of new news and uh community calendar has really got embedded and I'd like to get it back to where it was before. So, um, and I don't mean to be negative about that. I'm just saying, because I've gotten the emails and I know I forwarded them on to Joan and CC to Adam. Um, so whether it's a, an agenda item where Ms. Roman comes in or a report from Ms. Roman at a future select board meeting, I personally would like those two areas addressed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. And just before I, I, I talk, we, Mr. Helmuth made a motion to receive the survey. I don't think I got a second. Could someone? I'll take I okay, thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Um, I, Mr. Diggins, if you get had a second, I apologize. I, no, I think okay. I forgot. I'm sorry. Okay, no problem. And and I also want to say I I think you know there there, there have been some comments made tonight. I think the changes to to the website have been excellent. There are things here and there on the on the calendar issue. I think if for items that are that night or that week, it's right on the first page. I think that's very, very good. But I, I, I do visit a lot of municipal websites and I think this is uh, among among the best. And, and there are things here or there that we may see on other communities' websites that maybe we can bring to the attention of Ms. Robin or to, to, to the town manager and, and um, to, to, to continue to make ours even better. But uh, I appreciate the work that, that has been done in, in improving this and, and it is interesting um, for those people who do receive emails or, or notifications from the town, um, they're happy with it and, and, and they read everything the town is sending out to according to the to the responses. So that's a that that's a good thing. So on a motion from Mr. Helmuth, seconded by Mrs. Mahan for receipt, Attorney Heim. To her? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Vaughn? Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so the next item is new business. Um, and then we will have executive session afterwards. But Attorney Heim? The only new business I have is that, uh, I don't know if the manager had more up-to-date information on this, just that we're all waiting on the uh, status of the bill to extend remote uh, uh, public meetings. Uh, came out of ways and means, and we're still waiting for an update um, before June 15th. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Hyman. Mr. Chapdelain. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, no, I don't have anything more up to date than what Mr. He uh, Attorney Heim just shared. Uh, I did want to briefly share, um, as Mr. DeCourcy and Mrs. Mahan know, uh, we did share a brief framework or a framework of the ARPA, the American Rescue Plan Act. Uh, framework for the funding to the Long Range Planning Committee uh, several weeks ago now. We're awaiting further guidance on the guidance that was issued by the federal government, specifically in regard to how we can classify revenue loss to provide the 
greatest benefit to the general fund. Once we get that clarity, I look forward to presenting that framework, which can hopefully be more firm to the select board uh, in the near term future. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chapterling. Mr. Helmuth. Uh, thank you. I do have an item of new business. Um, so I, I would like to, to let the, the board and the community know um, of the Arlington High School Scoops Club upcoming fundraiser. And I have a personal connection to this. So for the second year in a row, the Scoops Club um, is hosting an Arlington's Got Talent live talent show. It's a live, live stream. Um, and uh, it, it so happens that a select board member that you know who happens to play the piano just might have an entry into this. And, and I told them I'm doing this because I want I wanted to know that I know other music besides the Star Spangled Banner. So if you wanna see the proof of that and you want to help raise money for the Jimmy Fund for the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, which these superb uh, group of students are doing, you, uh, you and the community can tune in to the ACMI YouTube live stream Friday at 6 p.m. And it's a repeat broadcast the same time on Saturday. Uh, I have some inside, informa inside information that my segment might be towards the towards the beginning of the program, but I encourage you to to watch it all. Um, there will be drawings for uh, this is a live broadcast. So there will be drawings uh, for some prizes from local Arlington businesses and an opportunity to make contributions to the Jimmy Fund right there during the program. And um, the following Saturday, so a week from Saturday, uh, the Scoops Club is doing their Scooper Mania. Uh, event which we issued a permit for a couple of weeks ago and uh, in front of the Dowling Museum um, in Arlington Center. So to learn more about these events, uh, people can go to uh, a bit.ly address, which is bit.ly slash scoopsweek. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Um, Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have um, three commendations and, and, and one um, new business item, and they'll all be brief. Hey, first, hey, um, thanks to the town manager for letting us know about, um, I think it's um, Officer Joe Kniff, or uh, I, he probably has some other designation uh, about the um, hey, the way he handled an incident in the Lugar. It could have um, it could have gone, um, it could have been very badly for the person you know who uh, essentially attacked him with a BB gun that looked very much like a real assault weapon. Oh, and and I met uh, Officer Kniff me for the first time uh, when I went out to Lugar. Uh, I guess it was the end of April to help with the cleanup there. And, and it doesn't surprise me that he would handle the situation well because he's 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 a really he's a really friendly guy and and, and it's very clear that he really cares about um, the homeless out there. Uh, and so so uh, I think. Yeah, I won't say we're fortunate because me, me, most of APD is is are, are good folks. I mean, and, and so just want to commend them on that. The second is um, virtual town meeting. Being, uh, I know there are a lot of database errors, you know, but having been involved in this the first time, I know what big heavy lift it was. I was not involved at all this time, which I say as a way to commend the staff for. Um, pulled it off. Maybe it was easier with me not being involved. I don't know. Uh, but I do want to uh, thank all of the town meeting members that helped uh, with getting out the um, the various uh, reports in that uh, the first batch of reports. And I mean, my intention is to write up something for them and get it into the record. Uh, third thing is there is this student um, at Arlington High. His name is um, Robbie. Uh, Kazan, uh, he has founded Kittlebyte. I saw a news art news story about him on Channel Five, and what he does is is he and maybe his organization helps me um, black boys he uh, learn computer programming. And the reason it's boys is because there was a program in at this other um, I forget the name of the the um, organization that does the same for for girls. I mean, and and it's just. It's so commendable because I got to tell you, it is these kind of programs that really help people a lot. I mean, I, I benefited from programs like this, I mean, not computers, of course, when I was a kid, but it's that kind of direct outreach I mean, that can really make a big difference in, in a kid's life. And uh, it's really great to see that coming out of Arlington High. And the last thing, and, and um, brace yourself, Barry, and, uh, I just want, I want to tell you that I'm toying with the idea you know, of um, trying to do a parade and then maybe um, dance party in lieu of, of a town day. 
I would take it on. And you probably tell me the members. Hey, so uh, if <laughs> there's, is there's any reason for me to not even ponder that, let me know. Uh, but but I'm just, like I said, I'm just thinking about it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Uh, Mr. Hurd. Thank you. Um, just along the lines of what Mr. Diggins had mentioned, um, this happened a few weeks ago, but with our abbreviated meetings, we, I didn't bring up a new business. But I want to thank the APD and the Middlesex Sheriff's Office for, I don't recall if we talked about this yet, but if they, they brought the mobile training unit to APD and invited us all to observe some of the de-escalation training that our officers receive. And it was really an amazing state-of-the-art unit. And to see the situations just on screen that the officers have to deal with was nerve wracking. I think I jumped, even though I knew it was a simulation. Um, so to imagine what it's like in real life. And then just a week or so later, hear about the amazing work of Officer Kniff over at the Mugar Woods um, just really shows why they do it and all the training that the town and the APD goes through to make sure that they can make the best decisions in these situations. So I want to thank the APD, Sheriff Katujan, who was there on site, as well as Officer Kniff for his amazing work. Um, then I just, I did want to mention, you know, as this is the wrap up of our virtual platform for our select board offices, I, for one, am happy to get back in the chamber. But I do want to thank everyone that's in the town that has helped make this a reality, particularly in town meeting, you know, town meeting went through slowly, but with the work of many, many, many people. And, uh, you know, I want to thank everyone that was involved and everyone that helped us with our meetings. Um, so, you know, it certainly was a slow rollout. So, and then I just would like to say the Bruins just scored their second goal. So we're hoping for a, a quick and rapid turnaround in the third period to try to keep them alive. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Uh, Mrs. Mahan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, nice. I have a lot of things for new business, but I'm going to try to condense it. Um, regarding the Recovery Act funds and the Long Range Planning Committee, I'm going to leave it to the chair, uh, perhaps in July or August, um, to sort of give a little more detailed reporting back to the select board um, regarding the discussions we've been having and or uh, forwarding any uh, PowerPoints or uh, presentations from uh, Mr. Foskett regarding um, a future override that we, it seems, have pushed out at least one year because of the Recovery Act, but there's some other questions. Um, to me, it's a big issue. And uh, I'd like, you know, before September, my colleague, through um, Mr. DeCourcy, because when both he and I were uh, named to long range planning, he, uh, Mr. DeCourcy said, well, I'm assuming you're the senior member, you're gonna be chair of it. And I said, heck no, <laughs> you are Mr. DeCourcy because you're far more qualified. So he's chair of that committee. So I'm gonna leave it to him whether it's in the July, August meeting, because I think um, we really need to have that information because it's um, really important. Uh, I wanna thank the um, Arlington Fire Department um, for uh, fire at 30 Egerton Road um, that unfortunately there was um, pretty extensive um, property loss, but there wasn't any uh, resident or uh, firefighter loss there, uh, as well as I know Chief Kelly has put out that Arlington has had three or four, I, I don't know if Egerton Road was the third or fourth fire here in Arlington. And he's, he's put something on the town website uh, to people to uh, be a little more vigilant and aware in terms of uh, why these fires are happening. Um, around the Arlington Police Department, I know that my colleagues have spoken about 
both of these, um, I do feel there's a, a very small minority of people in Arlington that want to speak ill of the Arlington Police Department. I know I saw several Facebook pages that were complaining about um, a tractor trailer being parked in front of the police station and they were violating overnight parking, even though it said right on it, Middlesex office training. Um, so I thank my colleagues for bringing that up because that's what it is. And I, I've taken that training before as my a previous colleague. Unfortunately, there's a very small pe group of people in Arlington that are so anti-police that have been bashing them. And I'm, I've, I've been really frustrated uh, by it as well as um, I know my colleagues have already highlighted this with Officer Kniff and the other officers that responded down to the MUGAR um, site um, with the uh, weapons that look like rifles and they weren't. Um, thankfully, I was concerned considering, considering previous, a previous incident that someone in that incident might get suspended, which happened before, which I'm still very irate about. Um, but that didn't happen, thankfully. Um, and then, um, and I apologize for that, but I'm like really upset about, especially around the Arlington Police Department. We've, we've been touting them since Fred Ryan was here, state of the art, national, we could put them up against anyone else in the country. And I really feel like, um, not the board, because we don't have the decision, the, the decision-making powers, but the most recent suspension really irritated me. And I wish there was something more I could do for that. But I feel like people who made that decision cave to political pressure and they're not politicians. And then um, the last two things would be, I would ask um, the chair, um, if we could, perhaps at the next meeting, because I'm very concerned about this, and I know my colleagues are, because we've all sort of talked about this um, at meetings leading up to this. If it's possible at the next meeting, if we could have Mr. Rademacher, um, Mr. Chairman, perhaps be an agenda item uh, to discuss the uh, work uh, down at the DPW Grove Street location, uh, especially in consideration of the hazardous waste um, I know some of the employee functions have been removed from the site, but they still have roll call there and there. From what I understand, moving into the paint shop and different buildings. But I'd like to hear from Mr. Ronemacher um, what the plan is down there. And when they truly do open and deal with the hazardous waste, I want to hear those employees aren't going to be there or if they are, how they're going to be protected. And it also includes school employees with school buses. And then the last thing is, maybe this can wait until September, but um, either through the chair and or the town manager, if we could get a construction update on the Allenton High School uh, building project, which I know Frank Callahan and a whole bunch of other people on the committee have been doing an astounding job. But um, I'd like to, if we can do it over the summer, if not, if we can get it in September. And that's it for my new business. Thank you so much. Okay, th th thank you, Mrs. Mahan. I, I have a few things. Um, I, I do wanna address two things that Mrs. Mahan said. On the long range planning, we will have a presentation in July. I think that the town manager had mentioned that there, there's gonna be more guidance. There is um, looking at the use of the funds and, and what can be used to, to apply for lost revenue. And I, I have had conversations with the town manager on that. And so I, I think that's gonna be a July item. And on the DPW issue, we can have a presentation on that. I have talked to the town manager and he may have talked to some members about what the plan is. And so there is a plan and we can, we can, um, we can put that on for a discussion item at a future meeting. Um, I have a few items. The first thing I, I I want to thank my colleagues for bringing up the, the outstanding work that Officer Kniff did at the, at the Mugar Woods and de-escalation. De-escalating was, was a very dangerous situation. He's actually there with Hannah O'Halloran from the Somerville Homeless Coalition. And again, it has been a great partnership between our police department and the Somerville Homeless Coalition and, and our 
Health and Human Services Department. And there'll be more on that, um, I, I think, at our next meeting. But I do want to say um, we've had discussions earlier this year about the issue with the ownership of the Mugar property and the lack of, of any cooperation on cleanup, on responsiveness, on, on just basic respect. Um, so I am going to be working with the town manager to have a meeting with the ownership. I am going to put an agenda item on June 21st. If there is no action, I, I want to discuss action and, and take action as a, as a town. Um, this has gone on far too long without any response and, and following this incident that took place with Officer Kniff, we did reach out as a town um, to the Mugar interest and we didn't get any response. And, and I, 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 we got a response, okay, we had a conversation, but we didn't get anything meaningful. Um, this will be an agenda item on June 21st and, and I'm anticipating that there will be action items. We will report what if anything happens at the meeting, but um, it, it, the, the lack of any cooperation here is astounding and, and I'm beyond disappointed about it. So um, that will be coming up later this month. Um, a few things I, I did wanna point out again for a discussion item, we're gonna have a long meeting on June 21st, I think. We've received some inquiries at the select board office about a package store license and about the remaining marijuana license. I wanna put something on for our agenda to discuss what if anything we wanna do whether reopening that process or, or where we go over the summer. So I just want to alert board members that we will have a discussion about that. I want to have a shout out to the political action club at the high school. I met with them today for about an hour and had a really good meeting and I appreciate the engagement um, that, that our um, high schoolers have for local state and federal government. That was a good meeting. And the last thing I do want to say, and, and this is further to what Mr. Hurd said, is we are planning on being back in the chamber on June 21st. And I want to thank everybody for um, all the work. I think this is the 39th or 40th select board meeting since we've had to go to the remote format. So I know speaking for myself, I'm really looking forward to going back to the chamber, but I appreciate everything that has been done with the town uh, staff, with ACMI and with the public to, to, um, to allow us to continue to conduct the town's business over the past year. So we will have, we're planning on being back in the chambers. We are gonna have a remote format. We're gonna have remote participation options and it, it may be rough, but I, we, we've got to move ahead and do this. So that's all I have for new business. Um, we are gonna go into executive session now or pending a vote and we will not be returning into public session. We'll, we will be adjourning. So if I could have a motion from one of the members to, to move into executive session. Mr. Chair, if I could make a motion to uh, move to executive session and that when we adjourn from executive session, it will be for the sole purposes to make a motion to adjourn. Thank you, do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. So on a motion by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Diggins, the executive session is for the approval and release of executive session minutes of January 2nd, 2020. Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurt? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Allen? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. Corson? Yes. Okay, we're going to executive session if we can cut the ACMI feed and um, remove any folks 